I'd like to start first with a word of prayer tonight, if that'd be okay with each of you. Maybe you can take the hand of the person next to you, and let's just agree for the Lord's release upon this night and what He has in mind. Lord, we give you praise for the, the love of God that you've extended through us through Jesus Christ. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that that mercy is new every morning, and we thank you for the extension of it upon our lives, even this very hour. Lord, we desire that you would receive glory tonight in all that's said and accomplished in this meeting. We desire, Lord, that your Spirit would direct each of us to not only have a, a voice to speak, but ears to hear and hearts to apply the truth that you would give to us. We give you praise, Lord, and we thank you for the authority that you've given to us to hold back the forces that would oppose us in your work, Lord. Tonight, Lord Jesus, we say be magnified in our midst and give us a sensitivity to give... Uh, the direction of your spirit as you would lead. Nothing more and nothing less, Lord. And for that we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I want to begin to start sharing with you tonight, um, first from a background that may, may seem a little unusual to you, um, from where I came from. And you may have to actually try to place yourself uh, in the type of thinking that I was involved in at the time. Uh, I was born and raised as a Roman Catholic. Uh, my parents were Portuguese and, and Irish, and so there's a, a long lineage there of uh, Roman Catholicism. So uh, if you can possibly try tonight to put yourself in that kind of thinking, I think the, uh, the uh, presentation of the dream might help you. Is there anybody here tonight that uh, was a practicing Roman Catholic uh, before they met Jesus? Quite a few here tonight. Keep your hands up. That way I know who my friends are later on. Oh, okay, good, good. You'll know what I'm talking about in some of the different aspects of this presentation. Uh, as a little boy, I began to have visions. I wasn't sure what a vision was. This first happened to me as we were doing a traditional ceremony in the church called Stations of the Cross. Some of you folks might remember what that was. These were ten stations set up in a Catholic church where you would pray the rosary. When I received this dream, to kind of skip ahead just a moment, uh, I was not a Christian. I wasn't saved. I hadn't read really much of the Bible whatsoever except a few uh, passages on Sunday in church. We, we had a few passages that we would read occasionally. And in high school, I read uh, uh, the Gospel of John. So uh, I wasn't in a place where I knew what was happening in this dream. And this uh, disturbed me greatly. And so you'll see tonight as this begins to unfold that uh, God is an amazing God as to why He would reveal something to someone that knew nothing at all. And so I'm going to kind of ask you, try to put yourself in that place tonight, realizing that uh, don't sit in here tonight uh, for, for long as you're hearing the dream, knowing what you know right now, but try to put yourself, so to speak, in a place where you didn't know any of this, and it was being revealed to you in such a way uh, that it was the first time that you ever saw or heard such things uttered. As I said, I began to have visions as a little boy uh, in the second grade. Uh, the first time was when the Stations of the Cross, which were pictures on the wall, actually came to life and Jesus was uh, carrying the cross in the week of Passion. I saw him as a little boy with the crown of thorns on his head, uh, just shoved into his, uh, his head. They were long thorns. They weren't like what I had always thought in my mind, maybe like rose thorns or something like that, but they were long thorns and they were actually, some of them were protruding from the sides of his, uh, his head. He was bleeding a, a great deal down his face. His face was uh, beaten uh, extensively, almost to the point that it was difficult to tell uh, who this person was. Many things I've learned over the years uh, from following the Lord that were actually uh, clear scriptural directions about his life that I saw in visions before I had read the Bible. This is part of the reason that I'm so certain about things that God has shown me because of how they've come to pass and played themselves out. As I saw this, uh, I saw from the point of him carrying the cross where the lacerations on his back were more than just stripes. I always imagined in my mind they were just, you know, stripe marks, but they were actually deep lacerations uh, where even the, the tissue of his muscles were exposed. And so it was a very gruesome thing to see as a little boy. I saw him crucified. The cross I saw was not high off the ground, but actually uh, only about two feet off the ground. 
And I saw dogs urinating on the cross. I saw people spitting on him. I saw people mocking him verbally. Uh, it was a very, very violent scene that I saw as a little boy. If you can just try to imagine for a few moments a second grader seeing this, and it actually was played out to me uh, in a vision that seems much more real than you being here tonight uh, in front of my own eyes. I don't know how to explain right now how that happens. I just believe that God chooses to do things uh, because He's God and He's uh, omniscient and He has His ways. Uh, I wish somehow I could tell you the formula for how your mind works in a vision, but I just don't know. This began to keep continuing in my life till about seventh grade, and I finally got to a point where the peer pressure and the troubles that I was getting in with my friends uh, because of crying and, and being touched by the presence of the Lord, although I didn't know that that's what was happening, uh, I was being kind of persecuted for it. My family thought I was a little off. And so I pretty much asked God, stop this. I don't want any more of this. This is not blessing me. This is not helping me. I'm losing uh, my friends. I'm losing, uh, you know, credibility with my family. They think I'm nutty. They think I'm losing my marbles. And so just stop this. And it stopped. And I, I must say, uh, about a short time after that, I became quite rebellious. Uh, at the point, uh, up until that point where I asked it to stop, I was a very sensitive young person, uh, real obedient to my parents, uh, just a good student, had won some citywide awards. But as soon as I asked this to stop, pretty much my life began to really take a clear direction uh, in the wrong path. Uh, several years later, I had gotten married, and, and uh, in early 1980, around August, uh, I went to sleep this night. Uh, just about like any other night, um, I want to tell you some specifics so you'll know. I, I was not intoxicated. I was not under the influence of any hallucinogenic drugs. Although there had been some times I had smoked marijuana and had drank in my life, uh, the night that I had this dream, I did not go to bed in a condition of, of stupor or, uh, you know, intoxicated or anything like that. I fell asleep, and it was one of those types of nights when you kind of can tell you're falling asleep. You kind of, you know, drift off, and you know you're just about asleep. Just as soon as I fell into sleep, this dream began to start. It started with a very, very, very loud noise. The best description that I can give to you would be to tell you it sounded like a, a, a car horn uh, from the 70s. How many of you remember what car horns sounded like in the 70s. They were very loud horns in those days, where now they're just kind of a little beep, 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 beep kind of horn. But in those days, I mean, if you really laid on the horn, they were loud. This kind of sounded like that, except for it was extremely loud, very ear-piercing, and it, it lasted for a long period of time, kind of like a stuck horn. Has anyone ever heard a stuck horn? Yeah. It was very similar to that. Uh, right at that moment of hearing this, I was given the ability... Again, I'll share with you some things that seem to be very chronological in how this dream worked out. And yet, in some places, I can't tell you specific time frames because it was almost as though I was interjected into different situations uh, without the understanding of time moving along. Some things were just very panoramic. It was just a wide, big picture that I saw. But at this point of the dream, I was given the opportunity uh, to see kind of from the... Um, the heavens looking down on the earth. And what I saw was that I was able to see it, the globe was kind of out here like this, and I was able to see very clearly many cemeteries and graveyards. Then I was brought very close to many of these graveyards, and what I saw was a very unusual thing to me, it was that the ground was breaking open. Literally, the dirt was breaking open kind of violently, and people were coming out of the graves. Um, I'll tell you that as a Catholic, I prayed many, many times that uh, I believed in the resurrection of the dead. But I, I don't really believe at that point in, in the dream especially that I was persuaded that that would actually happen. I know now that that's what I saw. I saw dead people resurrected from the graves. The condition that they came out was very unusual. And uh, the, the other thing that was unusual was that uh, one cemetery plot uh, headstone would have a person come out of the dirt and one next to it would not. There, it seemed to be uh, uh, a kind of a, a not, not just random, but kind of a categorized uh, launching, so to speak, of these people out of the dirt. Uh, again, it was very violent. It was almost... Um, 
as though the, the, the dirt was receiving a small explosion or something and breaking open. And I literally saw dirt flying. And I saw this all over the globe. It wasn't just in one area. It wasn't just in, say, the United States. It was all over. And when people would begin to come out, their appearance, uh, two things about their appearance first astounded me. The first thing was that the clothes they were wearing uh, seemed to be like a choir robe. Uh, they they uh, were kind of like a long dress, so to speak, uh, a cloak almost hanging off them. Uh, but in the middle of the day, uh, it was like um, uh, those outfits that entertainers wear when they're under the lights and the lights, uh, you know, key in on them and the sequins kind of make the light just shoot off and they glimmer. These people came out in the middle of the day glimmering. Their outfits and their person was brighter than the sun. I, I, I wish I could explain that to you other than I could see the brightness of these people coming out. Men, um, although they had these robes on, appeared to be very, very masculine. Uh, you know, I always used to think that, you know, those robes I had to wear when I graduated from school kind of looked kind of feminine, you know. But these things that these people were wearing were masculine, and yet when women were resurrected, uh, they looked very feminine. Again, I'm going to give you the, the, the dream exactly as I saw it. Some things I wish sounded more exciting, and other things I wish were just a bit tamer, but I'm going to give it to you exactly as I saw it. These people that came out, it was difficult for me to explain this over the years, older people would come out with the appearance that they were old, but they weren't old. They, you could tell that they had lived a full life, uh, maybe you know, 80 years, 75 years, something like that. But uh, say, for instance, their hair that was lost was, gone, was back again. Um, they looked mature, but they didn't look aged. Okay? Young people, I saw a lot of young, young people resurrected. And uh, although they looked very young, they, 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 they weren't very young. They, there was a maturity about them. I, I wish, again, I could clearly define how this appeared uh, during the dream. Um, the, the, the position that I was in at this time didn't give me the allowance to understand these things because of the staunch Catholicism that, that my family and I had practiced. I had never heard of, of Protestant uh, Christian practices. I had never been to a Protestant church. I had never uh, experienced someone witnessing to me the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, and the plan of salvation. I had never read the book of Revelation. And to be very, very frank with you, uh, even to this day, it would have been a lot easier for my life if I would have never been given this dream. Uh, I wanted to just kind of do my thing and uh, carry on with my life. I thought it was going just fine until this began to happen. So just to, to help you understand, I did not ask for this. I've never asked to see the Lord. I've never asked to see angels. I've never asked to have visions. Uh, usually every time I get something like this, I end up getting in some sort of trouble. And so I, I don't really like the trouble that kind of follows you uh, when God starts to show you things. Uh, the other thing that I want to make clear to you is when this was happening, I really didn't understand that it was God at first. And so just to have you understand where I came from, there was no desire for me to experience this dream. Uh, all of a sudden, the people that came out, uh, they, they, just, they just disappeared. I wish I could tell you where I saw them go. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if they were taken and hidden somewhere. I don't know if they were taken in the clouds because I never saw them go up. I never saw them go away. They just vanished. Okay. One thing I can tell you is I did not see one person on planet Earth changed like we've read in the Bible where it says, you know, the dead in Christ shall rise first and those which are alive and remain shall be changed. I didn't see anybody at that point when I saw these people come out of the grave changed or get zapped out of planet earth, meet the Lord in the clouds. I didn't see anything like that. Okay? Again, I need to tell you, I had never heard of a rapture. I had never, I, as a Catholic, second coming of Christ was not even a dogma of our church. We didn't practice the belief in a second literal coming of Jesus Christ. And so this all was very foreign to me. And uh, as soon as these people... Uh, disappeared, for a lack of words, wherever they went, mass hysteria began to hit the earth. Uh, people had the appearance of absolute despair, um, hysteria, there was pandemonium everywhere, there was mass chaos, lawlessness and fearless, or fear was working everywhere. 
Uh, I was able again to see in many quadrants of the earth, and there wasn't any one nation that was under this. All of the globe was experiencing this. It was a, a very, very unusual uh, instance that happened. It, in the dream, uh, uh, I wasn't able always to uh, perceive what was going on, and yet I was still struggling with my mind during the dream. I don't know if you've ever had dreams where you were dreaming things, but in your mind you were very much... Uh, aware that you were dreaming and it was almost kind of like you were two people you know what I mean it's like you were almost divided I was seeing the dream happening and yet in my mind I was really not wanting to be a part of this dream but I to be very frank with you I had no choice as this dream was unfolding and by the way it lasted the whole night with the interruption at about three o'clock in the morning I had no control to come out of this dream uh, I will tell you that I've learned how to change my dreams. When I go to bed and the devil decides to try to give me a bad dream, I've learned how to tell my mind, not going there, nobody's going to chase me with a gun and try to shoot me. I'll just change it. Well, let me tell you, I could not change this one. I wished I could have somehow. Uh, definitely my life for 20 years, uh, part of it anyways, would have been a whole lot easier. It wasn't easy to receive this. It wasn't easy to sit on it for the amount of time that I've had to sit on it. Uh, my credibility has come into question many, many times because of, well, if this is so powerful, why didn't you share it? Well, I firmly believe that if I would have shared this uh, publicly when I got this, one, nobody would believe me because there was no credibility established in my ministry, and two, it would have probably destroyed me because I didn't possess the character, character of Christ needful to really walk out something like this and understand what uh, all entails with a revelation like this. Paul talked about revelations coming and bringing trials, and so I know that I really wasn't ready for this. Uh, as the mass pandemonium and despair began to permeate society, there was uh, a very unusual event that happened. Television, uh, telephone, radio, and this other unusual communication device, I was able to see into many, many homes in the United States, these white boxes that were about this big that looked to be like televisions. And were, when I saw these, they were in nearly every single home in the U.S., and uh, they would have words written across them, and occasionally it would almost look as though television was playing through them. All of those uh, media devices were shut down for about a two-week period. I know now that what I was seeing was personal computers in people's homes. In 1980, I've done some studies, by the way, about all the things I saw to see if, in fact, I was hearing something from God, because I'm not about to go on national television or around the globe and share this if it's incorrect. I have a ministry of my own right now, and I don't feel like jeopardizing what the Lord has established for the past 17 years. In, in 1980 and 81, there was less than a half a percent of American homes that had a computer in it, personal computer. IBM was just transitioning from data entry cards into hard drive and, and uh, RAM memory into their computer processes. The one computer that was on the scene at the time was called a Commodore. Some of you might remember that. It was actually a word processor with a very, very small amount of memory. And so I saw these in homes just about everywhere. All these things were shut down. Uh, one of the things that was happening during this uh, hysteria was many, many peoples were asking, where did these people go? What happened? And all the globe saw this event, uh, or they experienced it afterwards. What I saw in people was that literally nearly everyone I experienced had a great, great look of despair and hopelessness upon their face. Everywhere I went, there was hopelessness. Nobody seemed to be happy about living. Um, you know, I've never experienced that. I've been to a lot of public places where people are bummed out, not happy, not doing well, but not the globe in masses. I don't know, maybe you've seen that. I haven't. Uh, so this hysteria brought a complete hopelessness and total perplexity to just about everyone. The television communications were down for a period of time. Again, people have asked me, well, what do you think caused that? I I'm really not positive, but I would like to put something on the overhead tonight uh, to show you an article. And for many of you uh, Prophecy Club folks here tonight, this, this isn't new information to you. For some of the visitors that might be here, this may be very new information. This was an article. Let me move this down just a hair. 
This was an article that was given to me two weeks before this tour started. Let me share with you a few details. I did not want to take this tour, okay? I really did not want to connect to the Prophecy Club. Uh, when I got the prophecy for them, the Lord had told me some things about this ministry and how everything they were saying was about the end times. And I'm thinking, no, 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 I don't want to go there. I've, booted, I've been booted out of enough churches. I've been, I've been persecuted enough for my position. I'm not going to hook up with anybody that's going to just completely declare the end as they really believe it. Now, you know, uh, all of us have to leave the fear of man sooner or later in our lives. Amen? So uh, that's what I had to do. And uh, when I was praying about this tour, the Lord said He would give me daily a sign everywhere I went, a sign in the natural that what I had seen was truly Him. We walked in the airport today. We were coming through the terminal and He showed me uh, uh, a Humvee sitting in the main area of the terminal of this airport. And by the way, it was the exact type that I saw. The one that I'm going to show you tonight on the overheads later, it's not the same one. This article was a reprint. Uh, actually, I have the original copy if you would like it. Uh, I can get it to Prophecy Club and, and you could uh, request that. They'll you know, get it to you. Uh, this was in the uh, 1991 uh, Santa Barbara, California news press paper. This has to do with a single high altitude nuclear blast by a rogue nation which could, would bombard the continental United States with electromagnetic rays, crippling civil and military electronics from light bulbs to computers. Uh, military experts warned Congress Wednesday. Uh, such an explosion would unleash electromagnetic pulse. I'm going to move this up just a hair. Would release an electromagnetic pulse that would erase computer data in banks, stock market, halt cars, trucks, shut down electricity in the lower 48 states. This is interesting to me because I prophesied a long time ago that Alaska would not experience the judgment that the 48 states would receive. I got this paper and I thought, oh, that's interesting. The pulse would last only a fraction of a second. Our civilian telephone, electricity, communications, and electronic plants are all naked to our nuclear-armed enemies, said Lowell Wood, a physicist with the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories. Even a modest single explosion EMP attack on the U.S. would likely devastate us as a modern post-industrial nation. i move this up just again a bit. Any nuclear-capable nation, including Russia, China, and North Korea, I'm going to talk to you tonight about North Korea, some specifics. Uh, I have some inside information that the Lord has allowed me to see about North Korea and China. Uh, any nuclear-capable nation, including these nations, could cripple the U.S. military machine and lay waste to modern American civilization, said Wood, who also is a consultant to the Defense Department. Again, that's an article from the 1991 Santa Barbara News Press. How many folks here tonight already know about that? Okay. Some things that we, we learn, we learn in the natural. Other things we learn in the spirit. Much of what I've learned about end time uh, revelation has been in the prayer closet. I haven't got to uh, go into government strategic positions and things like that except in the spirit. And so I'm actually quite excited that God is, is showing me some things that um, uh, other men have got to be a part of by being strategically placed. This uh, shutdown alarmed all of the peoples and it lasted for about two weeks. Can you imagine briefly tonight all of your communications, your telephone, computers, television and radio being shut down for a two week period of time? Can you imagine the hysteria? Can you imagine, you know, the inability for a supermarket to contact its suppliers to get more, more supplies or gasoline or, or transactions? I mean, just, I mean, it's, it's amazing when you begin to see it kind of unfold the depth. This lasted about two weeks. Again, I want to remind you, I was not a prophecy studier or expert at this time when this vision came to me. I began to walk the streets in shock at the current events. The events are difficult to describe because lawlessness and fear was permeating society completely. After about two weeks of time, television and radio began to be back up and running. However, it was completely different than what was previously uh, being broadcast. The broadcasts were being bombarded nearly everywhere and they were depicting 
a soon-to-come new government and leadership. A man would be emerging to lead us. The man finally came on the scene, and he spoke with great eloquence. I wrote these things down exactly as I saw them. He spoke, he spoke with great eloquence and charisma. He was soothing and promised answers to all current issues. This man was smooth and extremely convincing, able to solve nearly all problems. He was the consummate communicator, and he explained how this removal of people was God's judgment upon them. This rattled me in the dream. I, I did not understand his position. Let me tell you so you can kind of comprehend where I'm coming from. Not being a, a born-again Christian in the dream, when this man spoke, it, it, it began to convince me. It began to pull me in to the messages. I don't know if any of you have seen old uh, film, uh, films of Adolf Hitler speaking to the masses, but he had a demonic uh, charisma about him that would literally pull the masses to him. That was nothing compared to what I saw. Nothing. He was able to rally a nation. This, this individual was rallying the globe. It was very, very frightening. Uh, almost immediately, he began to communicate through large screen televisions that were strategically placed everywhere the general populace met. Think back for me for just a few moments. 1980, 1981. Large screens televisions? No. A few pizza parlors had those projector televisions, you know, with the three different colors that would project an image, but large screen televisions weren't out, folks, and neither was 24-hour news. Everywhere the populace met, big screen televisions were pumping this message. I travel a lot all over the place, and everywhere I go where the populace meets now, they have televisions. Restaurants have them. I've been to some restaurants where you have a television right at your table, so you're keeping up with everything. Airports, everywhere you go, everywhere the populace meets, you're being bombarded with messages. This was the norm. Now, what was strange about this is that this man's speeches and directions for the whole world had to do with new times upon us as human beings, new directives for global peace, and the need to give up current citizenship for world citizenship. Now, I must tell you, I've been raised a red-blooded American. And when I heard this in the dream, I could not fathom it. Uh, you know, I've always had a, a gun. I've always hunted and fished. And I've always put my hand over my heart at ball games when we sang the, the, the uh, national anthem. I've always respected men in the military and women in the military. I love this country. And so to have this experience in this dream rattled me to the very core of my being. This man continually and constantly spoke of world order and the benefits of all men dwelling together in peace. Now, even though I was disturbed in the dream, I was also being pulled into this because it sounded very, very good. World peace sounds good until you see the cost. Let me tell you, there is no world peace until the Prince of Peace establishes his throne on this earth. That's the bottom line. No human being is going to bring peace to this earth. Only the human being who's all human, all God, is going to bring peace to this earth. That's Jesus Christ. And so I began to really think of relinquishing my citizenship, and this alarmed me uh, greatly. Uh, even though this was a, a message that pulled strongly upon me, I somehow wasn't convinced of this new order. I constantly heard the word new order, world order and new times, but I never did hear new world order. I don't know why. You know, I don't know if they change the name in the future or if, or if the dream was trying to show me different perspectives. I, I don't know. A lot of things I've asked the Lord and He hasn't answered my questions. Some things He's answered them very clearly to me. So my freedoms and my patriotism were instantly being eroded from my understanding. Now listen to this, please, very carefully. At staggering rates, people were buying right into this plan that this man was releasing through the airwaves at staggering rates. No resistance. No one was fighting it. No one was saying anything publicly. I, I, I can't tell you if the airwaves were uh, controlled to the point where you couldn't come on and say certain things. It's just about like that right now in the U.S., by the way. You, you can't just get on the three major networks and say what you want. I mean, no, I'm telling the truth tonight. You can't do that. 
And so I don't know if that was the occurrence at the time or if basically it was just that everything had turned over. Some things, like I said, I don't have all the answers to. I began to go into a serious, serious depression. I began to ask myself questions. Is this the end of the world? You know, I think just about every person that's been born has always wondered uh, in the inside of themselves about the end of the world, regardless of when you were born. You know, it's amazing to me that you read the, the epistles and you find that even when Peter and Paul were preaching, they were already asking if the end of the world was upon them. And so I began to ask those same questions to myself. I, at this point in the dream, some very unusual things began to happen. I was hopeless, and so I, uh, I, I've always had a practice in my life when I'm in despair or in confusion to go for walks. I still do it now. I live near a beach, and I'll walk on the beach. And so in the dream, I started going for walks, and, and I was hoping for answers. You have to understand, the whole world was experiencing this despair and this, uh, this chaos that was permeating society. No one, by the way, was isolated from this. No one was hidden from this. This was engulfing the whole globe. I was able to see into different regions, into different continents, and everyone was experiencing this. It was almost as though the world had all become a third world nation completely behind the times with the ability to, to uh, emotionally process what was going on on the earth. As I was look, uh, walking one day, excuse me for a moment, I've been speaking and praying and prophesying a lot lately. Uh, I began to search for some answers, and uh, I didn't know where to search. One day, I ran into an elderly gentleman, and he was the first person during this period of time in the dream that actually appeared to be friendly. He, uh, he looked like uh, that maybe he had some hope, or maybe he uh, might know what was going on. And so I stopped him, and I asked him a few questions. I asked him, do you know what's happening in the world? Do, do you have any idea what's going on right now? Uh, earlier, I had told someone that what it appeared to me with this despair, it was that like every person on earth had just left their mother's funeral. Everyone. Can you imagine that for just a minute? Everybody on planet earth had to bury their mom that day and was leaving that, uh, that uh, funeral or memorial service with the weight of that. That's how people appeared. They were very, very grieving, very, very, uh, excuse me, despondent. Now, when I ran into him, I asked him if he knew what was going on in the world, and this is exactly what he said to me. He told me that the end was coming upon us and that he had not prepared for the times of the Lord. At this statement, sadness filled this man's countenance. Instantly, he went from being joyful to being very, very sad. He said to me that he had not been right with the Lord, and then he began immediately to tell me God's plan for man's salvation. He carefully reached in his back pocket like this and looked around over both of his shoulders to see, it looked as though to see if somebody was watching him. Now, I can't tell you if Bibles were banned at that point or not because, again, I wasn't specifically told that. I wish some things I could say were specifically told to me. This wasn't. But from his appearance, he was very concerned about who was watching him when he pulled this little book out. I didn't know at the time it was a Bible, by the way, because, uh, you know, I wasn't a Bible reader. You know, I was just a pretty typical young Catholic boy uh, doing my thing, and I wasn't interested in the Bible, the Word of God. He pulled this little, little pocket book out about this big and began to flip to script scriptures and would show me the different things in the Word of God about my need for Jesus to be my Savior. He told me that I had to ask Jesus to forgive me of my sinfulness and my sinful nature. And so uh, he told me if I, had, if I would do this, that I would be given eternal life and that, that God's power would lead me during this life and he would give me a victorious life. And I said, well, that sounds pretty good. And I was convinced and so I prayed. I prayed, I accepted Christ into my heart in a dream. Now this is a very strange occurrence, folks, to be a Catholic person not knowing how to find Christ by the born-again experience through the repentance of sins and receiving this in a dream. What's even more interesting is when I woke up from the dream, I could not comprehend it. It took two weeks after the dream for me to become a Christian. Seems strange almost, doesn't it? 
And so I, I prayed the prayer with him. He put his hands on me and, and prayed some, some different prayers. And as soon as this happened, joy began to fill me. And uh, I did as he said. I asked Jesus to forgive me for my sinful ways and to fill my heart with his presence. Now, it was unusual about this man because he had a small following with him. These were people that had accepted his message that he was telling them about Jesus Christ. Um, a very unusual thing was occurring at this time in the earth. Babies were being abandoned just about everywhere. Uh, almost on every street corner were babies abandoned, left in their little uh, baby seats or their baby uh, baskets. And th this was strange because they would be from infancy up to about maybe... At 16, 18 months, something like that. I could tell that there wasn't any babies over the age of two. And I don't know if that's because, you know, children, when they hit two, they start to change. You know, they have some kind of, a, I call it rebellion or something. You know, you tell them not to touch the cookies and they look at you and take it anyways, you know. You remember when that started happening to your kids? Well, we didn't pick up any kids like that for some reason. I don't know. Maybe God was sparing us. I have no idea. But we began to pick up children everywhere. And we began to take care of these children. I kind of joined up with this group of people because they were the only ones that seemed to have any peace at this time anywhere in the whole earth that I'd experienced. Now, some very unusual things were happening with this group of people. It was amazing to me how they could meet people's physical needs. They would always run into people who were in need and they would be able to meet their needs and then somehow lead them to Christ. Now, I didn't know how to do any of this yet because I had just kind of hooked up uh, with this man. In the dream, my wife had also become a Christian, a believer in Jesus Christ, and we were kind of hooked up with this man, kind of helping him out. I, I, I don't know if I had a job, to be honest with you. I, I don't ever remember working in the dream, although there was a couple occasions that I made business transactions. So it may have been that I was working and it just wasn't revealed to me as an aspect uh, that was important in the dream. I just don't know. Again, there's been many times I've asked to know certain things, and some things the Lord told me, someday I'll reveal all of it to you. And, you know, I don't know, maybe someday that will happen. I can tell you this, the man that I saw on the television, the man that could do the signs and wonders and fix all the problems, I will tell you this tonight, I will never forget his face, ever. As long as I live, I will never forget his face. Some people have been downloading information to me on my uh, email and downloading pictures of different people that are claiming uh, who they are. And let me just tell you, it's none of them. None of them. Not yet. Because I will never forget this individual's face. His face was almost supernatural in appearance. He was almost too perfect. He, he uh, was, for lack of terms, he was the most handsome man I had ever seen. And I just want you to know I'm a very happily married heterosexual, okay? When I say he was a handsome man, I don't mean that in a strange manner. I just mean to tell you that this man had everything going together for him. Everything. He, he, I was telling Stan that he had kind of a chiseled look to his face. And uh, everything about his appearance was almost perfect. And when he spoke, there was just a, a very strange quality about him. It's funny, many years later I read a scripture about the Lord Jesus Christ uh, from Isaiah the prophet that said that Jesus uh, had no comeliness or, or, or uh, features that we would desire to behold him. In other words, Jesus was not some handsome uh, specimen of a male. He was an average, rugged, uh, probably uh, different looking person. He wasn't uh, the kind of guy that would be voted, you know, most least or most likely to succeed on the, uh, on the, the GQ, so to speak, uh, charts. But this guy that I saw was. He fulfilled that perfectly. And isn't it amazing that the Antichrist would be the antithesis to Jesus? Yes. That he would have such a persona that it would be just the opposite of Jesus Christ. Although he was not actually prideful, he was very, very brash but he still carried the ability and uh, charisma about him to levy people into his situations. Um, at this point, we began to really connect with this man and his followers. And some other things that were very strange to me in my thinking was that somehow he seemed, this group of people seemed to happen quite frequently that things would just work out for them in the most unusual ways. Now, 
I, I, and during the dream, I didn't know what was going on. I did not know that God got involved in the affairs of men. I didn't know that the big God of the universe would come down and, you know, be actually interested in, in the affairs of man. As, as, as I grew up religiously, I, I didn't see him in that aspect. I saw him as a very busy God out there, and he had a lot to do, and probably I wasn't important enough because I wasn't a pope or a cardinal or a, a, a saint somewhere, or, you know, I wasn't one of those people, so probably uh, I was last on the list. And I know a lot of people feel that way about God right now. But I saw very unusual events happening with this band of followers. Food would multiply. Very unusual things would happen. They would pray for people and people would be healed. Uh, just very, very strange things uh, that was abstract to my thinking. Now, at this point in the dream, things really began to shift. And what happened was I was on my way to the bank to make a business transaction. Several things uh, in the dream I was revealed. For one, uh, let me see if I have something with me. Yeah, I do. Uh, I, I saw this money in 1980. I saw the money that has the big pictures of the different uh, figures on it. In 1980, this money wasn't even talked about yet. Another thing I saw shortly after this money was that the picture of the individual moved over a little bit and there was a blank space on here. And I was shown in the vision that the cash would carry bands in it that could be traced as to who was transacting the cash. You see, it's not just enough to know where your checking account goes and your electronic, say, visa transactions. They want to know where you're spending cash, too, because it's the ultimate control issue. And I saw this. And you ask yourself a question if you think I'm incorrect tonight. Have you been able to go just to any local printer and say, um, for instance, Kinko's, uh, I'd like you to print 500 of my checks up? Can't do it, folks. Your checks are banded with pertinent information so that your checks can be traced. All you have to do is put your checks under an ultraviolet light and you'll find this to be true. Checks are already being traced. They're already being tracked. I saw money that was being tracked. Yesterday, somebody sent us some information that the rainbow money is going to be in full effect by 2003. Right now, uh, within the next month, they're going to release the tens, fives, and ones for the new money. And I'm telling you, we're right on track. We're on a fast track, actually with these events happening. So I'm on my way to make a business transaction and a very unusual thing happened. There was an earthquake while I was going to the bank. I was just entering the bank and uh, across the street from my bank was a large, tall, about seven story building. It could be a little taller. I, I should have actually checked this one out. And by the way, everything I, I'll tell you is documented. You can check with people and names and situations if you're interested. This was, this was a triangle looking building and it was all glass in its appearance. If you think back to architecture in the early 1980s, especially 1980-81, they had just started to use all glass elevations on, on, on commercial buildings. It was just being introduced. Drive around any big city now and all glass buildings are the normal thing. It didn't used to be. Well, they were in this dream, this earthquake hit and began to shake this glass building and it fell over and killed about 200 people. This earthquake was massive, and I know from what I saw with the globe shaking at this time that it was a worldwide earthquake. Now, I'm a Californian, and I've been in a lot of earthquakes. As a matter of fact, I have some information about earthquakes tonight, about the last two big ones that hit California, and the Lord told me that they would come. He told me one would happen when the whole world's eyes were upon it. The whole world's eyes were upon the 1988 World Series in Oakland, California. And He told me if my people don't begin to repent, and begin to call out upon me, the next earthquakes will bring massive destruction and loss of lives. I watch civic and spiritual leaders say how we will rally in the power of our human spirit to overcome these obstacles. We will? I don't think so, folks. You know, I, I drive that Bay Bridge a lot to minister up in the Bay Area of California. If that earthquake would have hit any sooner, it would have killed thousands upon thousands of people on that bridge because it totally collapsed into the other. I was also recently involved in the Northridge quake uh, in 1995. I was in Ventura, California at the time driving down the highway when it hit. And uh, it was a very frightening thing. By the way, I don't know if you know this. I do know this for a fact. Uh, that the earthquake epicenter, the very spot of the earthquake, destroyed the biggest producer of pornography in the whole world. Amen. 
Okay, that's, that's something to say amen about. But I need to tell you, guess what's happened since? They've moved all their facilities to Chatsworth, California, and now they're producing twice what they produced in 1995. I heard spiritual leaders in the Los Angeles, San Fernando Valley say that these earthquakes are not the judgment of God. They're mishaps by nature. They said this publicly. And they wanted to try to tell people that these things were not the judgments of God. If you'd read your Bible, it's very, very clear that Jesus said that earthquakes are a sign of judgment. We'll talk about some things in a bit about that. The earthquake hit and there was multiple uh, millions of lives lost. Millions. I mean literally millions of lives. I've never heard of an earthquake where millions of people have been killed, ever. Uh, the, the world was completely stunned. The devastation of property and loss was beyond comprehension. It could not be measured. Some regions were so destroyed that they never bothered to send uh, rescue teams in. That's how devastated they were. I have some good friends, and including myself, that knew when God was going to touch Japan with a quake. Uh, two of my friends got the exact same number of the quake, and one of my friends gave them the day the quake would happen. One of my friends was ministering there, a mighty prophetess of the Lord, and she said, an earthquake's going to hit here. And she said, I'm afraid, get me out of the building right now. She thought it was going to hit at that very moment. It actually hit two weeks later, but they said, if you're ministering to us and you're a prophet of the living God, then, then you need to pray for us and pray for our people's homes and their buildings. And so she went out with oil and poured oil over every church, every place that people were willing to allow her to pray and the Kobe earthquake Japan uh, Japan quake never touched any of those buildings some of those buildings were parts of other buildings they were connected and one side of the building would fall everywhere that she had prayed was spared none of the people and the families that she prayed for lost lives none she goes to Japan now and needless to say it's like she's God they roll out the red carpet now you know when you're spared because of a prophetic word your mind changes about the things of God don't ever put your eyes on people. Put your eyes on the Lord. Amen. This was very unusual. This destruction uh, was global. It reached the whole globe, folks. Now, I want to tell you some things that began to happen at this point. This earthquake that hit caused a massive change in weather patterns. At this moment, what began to happen was the normal weather patterns completely changed. The, the, the patterns for winter became summer, summer became winter, and you might have a day of snow and a day of heat. The world was in total chaos in its weather patterns. Predicting weather was totally uh, impossible. You, there, it, was, it was just uh, useless to try to forecast weather. Predictions did not work. Some very unusual things began to happen almost immediately. Crops began to perish. Droughts and famine. I was able to see all over the globe the most fertile areas, the most fertile farming areas. I lived uh, at the time of this dream in the most fertile farming area in the whole world, the San Joaquin Valley of California. These areas were totally destroyed with drought and famine. Places that were once fertile were now arid deserts. It was almost hard to comprehend what I was seeing, and it was almost immediate. It was almost like somebody just took things and twisted the whole order. The thing that I tell you that was strange to me is that weather seemed to have its own mind. I, I, don't, I don't know how that would work, but I've heard some things from different people in the Prophecy Club about different issues, about how they're manipulating weather. But this weather was manipulated by the earth being shook from its axis. You say, how do you know that? I was above it and I saw it shaking. I saw the whole earth rocking around like it was a drunk person trying to walk. It was very, very frightening to me. Can you imagine being in this dream, not knowing what I know now biblically, not ever have re read, reading this stuff or ever have anybody witness to me about these things and seeing this happen? It was just uh, incredible to me. It was frightening to me. And I, I just couldn't... Uh, begin to express to you how uh, hopeless or uh, empty I felt about seeing all these things happening. <clears throat> Many times I wished I could have woke up and just pretended that this wasn't happening. Now, uh, right about at the time that this earthquake hit, very unusual things began to happen with law. I began to see local municipalities and no longer were police departments the enforcers of the law of municipalities. But military police driving very unusual looking vehicles that I now know to be called Humvees. 
I'm going to put this on the screen and talk to you a little bit about this vehicle. Can you see that good? Should I come up a hair or are you okay? We're okay. I'm going to do like Stan does here. Let's see. Hey, look at that. Oh, I have to hold it. Okay. These, uh, this is classy. I like this. These vehicles I saw looked a lot like this vehicle, except that uh, they weren't green. And uh, by the way, this was brought up on an internet uh, advertisement for me because I began to tell people what I saw. And uh, I, I, the first time I saw one of these, by the way, was on CNN in 1991 during the Gulf War. I don't know. You might have seen them sooner than that, but that was the first time I saw it. By the way, I was watching the report on the Gulf War because I was comparing what television was telling me in comparison to what the Lord had shown me in prayer. I know some things about Saddam Hussein. I know some things about some people that even Prophecy Club hasn't heard yet. And I'll share them with you tonight. This vehicle that I saw was black. They were on just about every corner of every main thoroughfare. The only difference is, like the one I saw in the airport today, I think it was today. Yeah, it was today. Man, I've really been going. Keep me in prayer. I just want to get home tomorrow. The, the one I saw in the airport today was amazing because it was almost the exact replica. And by the way, it was $94,000. Uh, this one was 72000 These are the yuppie cars in California, by the way. I guess they make these, I heard, here in Indiana somewhere. Isn't it amazing? You Indianans are corrupting Californians. <laughs> Never ceases to amaze me how we all corrupt each other. I really like this pointer. I'm having a great time with this thing. Uh, Stan told me to be myself, so I'm about to loosen up here in about five, mon five minutes and really have fun. Uh, these these uh, vehicles that I saw were black. And they, the top here was hard, but this part right here, see how this comes down? This was not a hard uh, back end here. This was a canvas or like a Jeep. You ever see the Jeeps, you know, without the hard tops? It was canvas here, and there was a man standing in the back. They were wearing very unusual outfits, by the way. They were wearing black uniforms and blue ball caps or blue helmets. The man that was standing in the back here was wearing a blue helmet, there was a big uh, radio antenna or some sort of a device here and a flag on the other side and this guy was standing up here and it looked like he had some big gun standing here. Stan asked me if I thought it was a machine gun and I said yeah I think it is but I, I don't know because I've never, I've never actually shot a machine gun or seen one. I did have an AK-47 at one time that was a lot of fun to shoot crows with I'll tell you. <laughs> but it was not a, a, a machine gun, it was a semi you know, automatic version, so you could only pull the trigger. I don't know if that's what it was. It looked to be one, but again, I would be embellishing if I said, yeah, I'm sure it was a machine gun. I don't know. All I know is these guys were everywhere. Another thing I was able to see is I was able to look inside of here, and on the inside of there was a, uh, what I know now to be a laptop type of computer sitting on the dash uh, with a computer screen that seemed to look much like the airplane I rode in today, a Canada Air regional jet that had all new digital GPS that just completely draws the picture for them so they follow without gauges. You could look into this computer and it would give them all sorts of information. You know, when I got my last California driver's license, I almost didn't want to take it. In California, we have holograms on the seal of the state and a strip of magnetic something on the back and then another thing with a whole bunch of information they say I've been trying to get mine to thrash out you know I put it in eel skin wallets and put tin, tin foil around it and I just want to mess with them I figure we have a little bit of time to mess with them we might as well right look folks they already know all of us as soon as you join Prophecy Club they know you it's a dead giveaway let me tell you and so these guys were able to get in here and use these computers, these onboard computers, to have information. At the same time I saw this, I saw uh, street uh, light standards, the kind like we have in California that really, you guys are still kind of old-fashioned out here. You have those wires that go across intersections with old lights hanging on. We have these huge standards that hang out. On the top of them, I began to see cameras, little white uh, oval-looking, hot dog kind of looking cameras. And in the dream, I, it was revealed to me that these cameras knew the whereabouts of everybody's vehicles. And, you know, they tell us, because people have been asking in California, hey, why do you have these cameras on the freeways? 
You've told us that they're for traffic control, but there's no street lights on the freeways, folks. You know, you can drive from where I live, clear down to San Diego on a freeway and never have a light. Why do they need those? And you think about it for a minute. These guys knew our whereabouts. They were parked on nearly every main thoroughfare. They knew your whereabouts. And what was unusual is they were fairly peaceful. I'm going to take this down. We'll get to some other things in just a minute here. These military police, or whatever they were, uh, by the way, uh, I don't know about you, but I did some checking again. In 1980, 1981, there were no blue helmets on any military in the earth. And there were no blue ball caps. While I was in Baltimore, see, I hadn't seen the blue ball caps yet. I'd only seen the blue helmets. In Baltimore, I missed my shuttle, and uh, just what a mess that day was. I, just just I got lost I mean I just but it was the Lord totally because he had me get on the wrong shuttle to get me back to where I needed to be to watch this television report of Sierra Leone and when it came on the air I heard the Lord say look at the television I don't like television and so uh, what happened was these guys were uh, fighting this uh, skirmish in Sierra Leone and they were wearing blue baby blue powder blue ball caps and the Lord said I told you I'd give you a sign in every place you'd go to show you I don't know what the blue ball caps meant, by the way, uh, when I saw them or the blue helmets, but I clearly know now who will be the policeman. I'm, I'm wide aware uh, of who will be in charge. Now, this, uh, this system of these police uh, was actually quite peaceful. They weren't rude. They weren't uh, mean to people. They weren't uh, obnoxious. I didn't see any looters or anybody getting shot or anything like that. They seemed to be peaceful, kind of parked at every corner. One thing that was happening is that you could not cross state lines at this time without papers. You had to have current papers to cross state lines. That was very, very strange to me. You know, if, matter of fact, uh, if it hadn't have probably been for Prophecy Club, I would have probably never really believed that part of my dream. I, I, I don't think I would have ever believed that our country would become a place where you can't cross border to border without papers, approved papers. But I saw it, and it was astounding to me. This new leader began to be on television again, and he was not resisted in the implementation of any of his policies, not one. No one stood up to challenge him. No one in America started a revolution. No one. There was no resistance whatsoever. Not on a grassroots level, not on a national level. No one. And you know what's amazing to me? In the 20 years from this dream, I'm totally convinced now that that's exactly what's going to happen. Because you can look at most of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're totally asleep right now. Right. If you start telling them end time things like this, they, they label you as a doomsday fanatical nutcase, you know, what are you, you, you one of those guys that are going to tell us that the, the end's going to come upon us and we're not going to get snatched out of here or get to get out of here without a little bit of problem, you know, just read your Bible. God didn't take Noah out of the earth, he put an ark around him. God delivered Lot from Sodom but still destroyed the place. He didn't take him into the clouds. Jesus said so many times himself, even in the high priestly prayer, he said that, hey, listen, Father, I pray that they might be one as we're one. But, Father, I pray that you take them not out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. You know, he's the one who said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. You know, and, and I'm sorry, but a whole lot of Christians right now think that we can just get out of here without it being a little tough. Could you imagine, honestly, if Jesus would come back to take His church right now? I think He'd be pretty disappointed. I know He's not always pleased with me. Just recently, a couple years ago, He told me the last two and a half years of my ministry burned up as wood, hay, and stubble before Him. That didn't please me whatsoever because I thought I was really pleasing God and I was under deception. Listen, folks, I used to be afraid to preach stuff like this completely. Oh, I'd give little tidbits here and there everywhere I went, but I was functioning in the fear of man. I was very afraid, just like some of you are very afraid. Must be a sign, huh? <laughs> right when you know you need to change, thunder comes. Maybe he's happy with me now. Behold, my son, <laughs> listen to him. <laughs> Actually, I must decrease that he might increase. 
I didn't mean it that way. We don't want lightning to come down through this building. Very unusual things in the dream transpired. The, the changes took place almost instantly and with complete ease. Complete ease. Uh, there was peaceful martial law, as I said. Military police were everywhere, and they knew everyone's whereabouts. I found out how they began to know this. See, I, I didn't understand this at first, and it was revealed to me. I, I asked myself questions as I was processing this dream. How could this happen so quickly? See, I'm a historian. I love to read about history, especially uh, American history. You know, uh, our forefathers fought those type of things. But right now, where are our forefathers? Where are men and women that are willing to stand up and say, hey, wait a minute here. This is not the direction we're choosing to go. Think about it. I mean, we all ought to pinch each other tonight. It's, I thought it was we the people. What about all of us? You know, when are we going to rise up and say, enough of this? You know, see, I'm not the only one who's walking in the fear of man. When are you going to rise up and tell your church that we're sick and tired of the truth not being preached? We want the truth preached. And if you don't, men of God, don't preach the truth, we'll pray that God will bring some who will. Well, that ought to get you excited. It did in every other meeting I said it in, but that's okay. Uh, are you trying to behave for cameras or what? You afraid they're going to pan and show your face and now they got you? The government's got you? They had you a long time ago, folks. I'll just tell you that right now. Yeah, thanks, brothers. There must be some ex-Catholics down there. I knew my friends would start speaking out sooner or later. A lot of questions I asked myself. Where were the ideals of our founding fathers? How could this happen in America? You know, I've heard of a lot of other nations having a coup attempts and governments overthrown, but it was usually through war. There was not even a bullet fired. Now, as time progressed in the dream, I was given the ability to realize by being in homes that television sets not only broadcast and transmitted programming, but they now had the capacity to actually send signals about you in your living room. See, I never really thought that could happen until an electronic engineer told me, Ken, anything that's electronic, that's, de that's designed, can do the reverse of its design. Anything. Your automobile can drive forward, it can go backwards. If you can receive a signal, you can, thank you, Lord, you can send a signal. Now listen, I was able to see that television sets were actually watching people in their homes monitoring their movements, monitoring their conversations. They showed me in the dream, or I was shown in the dream, that the television didn't even have to be on, it just needed to be plugged in. Guess what I found out? That televisions made after 1992 can in fact watch you. How many have 1992 and beyond televisions? How many think maybe you ought to throw a brick at it? <laughs> maybe you ought to go back to a yard sale and find one of those 80s models that quite, uh, you still have to turn the knob. Might be a little less convenient than surfing, but might be a little safer for you, huh? You say, how do you know this stuff? Well, because I've ran into people that showed me the demonstrations. One man showed me how your telephone could be bugged in your house with a $17 Radio Shack device. Called my house, rang the number, and says, hey, listen up. Hang up the phone, and now they can listen to everything you're saying. Do you know that your telephone, good old Ma Bell made sure that your little telephone, your Mickey Mouse phone, you know, all your little phones have in them one of the most sensitive microphones available? Why? So you can talk to Grandma better on the West Coast? I mean, think about it for a minute. Why do telephones need such sensitive devices? And why have they so rapidly went to the, the new type of cables that carry all the signals? Can't think of what you call it right now. Somebody help me. Fiber optics. Do you know that one fiber optic ca cable can carry over a million messages? Why? Why do they do things like that? Think for a minute. So that more people can be kept watch after. Not so that telecommunications gets better for us. It's, it's a game, folks. It's a big scheme. It's a big plan going on before us. Television continually, almost daily, explained to us that it, as people, 
if we would align ourselves with this new order, we would be saved from all of life's troubles. This is what this man said nearly every time he came on. The new order was said to have all the answers to problems and the leadership necessary to bring the change, causing the world to finally become the envisioned globe of peace. This is what we heard over and over. Folks, this was 1980 when I had this dream. It sounds like right now, doesn't it? Every day the paper is pumping in your mind and, and, and programs are pumping in your mind global peace, global unity. Everything that's advertisements about what? The internet and let's make the world global. Let's make it a small globe. You know, all of these issues are constantly being shown to us. And at this point in the dream, my work with this older man began to really step up. This is the one part of the dream that actually gave me hope. I began to work very extensively with this man, helping him. And what began to happen was, at this point in time, many so-called Christians, I put in my paperwork, as, by the way, when I got this dream, when I finished it up, I wrote out seven pages on a legal pad, much like this one, front and back. I would tell you, I could show you that tonight, but someone stole my desk that was the Secretary of the Interiors that was given to me out of my garage, along with all my high school annuals, my yearbooks, my letterman coat, and all my things that I had experienced as the Lord during a, a, a tough situation. And I've never been able to get any of it back, not even my annuals, which is, kind of still bugs me. So if you know anybody who knows where my high school annuals are, uh, I had a couple of love letters in there that, to, made me feel important. Sure glad I'm going to see my wife tomorrow. I miss her. Now, these so-called Christians were coming to the old man and his team of people, and they were explaining how they once had a relationship with Jesus, but had become cold in their faith and fell away from interest in a life of holy, passionate pursuit of God. Hmm. Now, for a short period of time, people were coming to Jesus in total surrender. I was able again to see above the globe, and what I saw was very, very unusual. Uh, I got to see certain regions of the earth where light rays were just coming out high into the atmosphere. It almost looked like uh, those, those big uh, searchlights, you know, with the flame on the inside of them. You've seen them before, how they shine up into the sky, except that these were very, very brilliant, almost... Uh, supernatural in appearance. I don't know if they were or not. They seemed to be. And I, after I saw these shooting off the globe in many, many directions, I was given the ability to go down into these regions and actually see firsthand what was happening. And let me tell you, it was the most exciting thing I've ever seen. And it's the very thing this, in this part of the vision that gives me the determination to continue what I'm doing right now. I've been ministering to the dead body of Christ in America for about 17 years. And to be very honest with you, I'm tired of doing it. That's why I'm working in Guatemala in a mission, in an orphanage that I'm a part of. Because they're willing to listen. They're hungry. They're thirsty. Americans think they know everything. And you know, uh, if it wasn't for this part of the vision, I would never minister here anymore. I'd move completely. But here's what happened. Beams of light, and I began to see 12 regions in the United States of America and all over the globe where these beams would just come out and begin to shine into the atmosphere. When I got down close, what I saw was mass revival hitting the earth. Now here's what I saw. I didn't see any Ken Peters. I didn't see any big name evangelists or prophets or apostles or famous television personalities. Not one. All I saw was normal, everyday children of God ministering in the power like the Bible described about Jesus and the disciples. And this was happening on a wholesale basis. Everywhere this was happening. Everywhere. People were praying for sick people and they'd be healed instantly. They would pray for blind eyes and they would open. They would pray for uh, dead people and they would resurrect. They were praying for the lost to come in and it was, folks, I tell you right now, I could, I could do a little Holy Ghost jig up here almost and start shaking and dancing and shouting in tongues or something. Let me tell you why. Because what I saw was the greatest thing I've ever, ever witnessed since I've been alive. 
Nothing I've ever witnessed on earth could compare to what I got to see. And this period of time lasted about three to four months, maybe six months max, maybe, maybe that long. It was so incredible. Regions were totally one for Jesus Christ. Now, I know for a fact this is possible because 15 minutes from our orphanage in a city called Almalanga, Guatemala, there is now a city on the earth that is completely Christian, 76,000 people. Amen. And they've come in unity and there's no more fighting amongst themselves and amazing things are beginning to happen, like vegetables growing in biblical proportions. I'm going down there with a friend of mine that's actually here in the meeting tonight uh, to do some more missionary work at the end of June, and I will send back to Prophecy Club digital videotapes of me holding these vegetables myself. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Carrots as big around as a man's arm. Huge. That tastes wonderful. Corn stalks that grow the biggest ears of corn you could ever imagine. Cauliflowers that take two men to hold. Heads of lettuce that are gigantic. They're sending to all Malanga right now scientists from all over the earth because the whole scientific community knows about this and they want to know what these Guatemalans have done to the dirt. <laughs> by the way, if you're interested, before I get back, a man by the name of George Otis Jr. has produced a video called Transformations and you can see it for yourself. This is a 15-minute Cessna flight and by the way I have a special appointment to meet with the head pastor of that region and I'm asking him to lay hands on me so that somehow there could be an impartation of the wisdom to find this unity for the body of Christ so that I can pray that other people will receive it in other regions. That's biblical. Paul said that he could impart to us a spiritual gift through the laying on of hands. So what I saw, folks, again, was so incredible. It was, it was, it's actually almost unbelievable. You know where it says in the Gospel of John that uh, Jesus said, that I, and these works that I do, you shall do also, and? Greater works. I didn't see greater works. I saw greater quantity. I didn't see anything greater than raising a dead person. But I did see greater quantity. It was almost as though everybody was like Jesus walking around just doing these works. And let me tell you, you did not have to have a pulpit to stand behind to do this in this part of the dream. As a matter of fact, those that stood behind the pulpit, I never saw any of them, to be honest with you. I think they were so finely understanding of the purposes of the ministry that they're behind the scenes equipping and releasing you and putting upon you the release of God for you to be God's superstars. What's more important? An average everyday believer that faithfully follows Jesus, accomplishing all those great things, or some guy that sits around, uh, like Stan was saying earlier, uh, just reading and praying? Well, that was another good chance for you to get a good lick in on Brother Stan, but... I like Stan, and I like to fool with him a bit, too. And I think if we're friends, that we should probably do a little bit of that. Uh, you know, he embarrassed me tonight, so... I just want you to know something. I'm just a normal person, folks. That's all I am. Uh, yes, I have a gift, and the gift works, but you have gifts, and they work, too. And God's very pleased with how your gifts work. And, and I'm nobody. I'm just a follower of Jesus Christ. That's all. And uh, so please don't put your eyes on people, ever, except the one person that's worthy of all of our praise, right? Yes. Amen. Now, a short period of time, this outpouring lasted, and literally, in, in regions, there was complete light, and then right next door, almost it would be like a city next to it, complete darkness. There began to be an agitation in the spirit realm that was incredible. At this point where all these miracles and things began to happen, this, this world order began to be very, very angry. Because what was happening was beyond their control uh, of, of the ability to manipulate it and stop it from happening. And this makes the devil very, very mad. You know, he gets very mad when we start functioning in the real power of the living God. That's, right. That's when he really starts pulling all stops out to try to do anything he can to stop the work of God. This was about to begin to happen. I began to see persecution on unprecedented scales. Isn't it amazing now that you've heard statistics in the church that in the last last 10 years, there's been more persecution worldwide to the body of Christ than in the history of the whole church in a 10-year period of time. We're about ready to start another orphanage in the Sudan. 
because God's given us an opportunity to minister to the head of a nation and his secretary of state who's going to give us the opportunity to start a spirit-filled work. See, I know some things about Africa that you don't know. I know why your gas prices jumped up 20 or 30 cents. See, because Arabs are pumping billions of dollars into Africa right now because they don't want Africa to, be, Africa to become a Christian continent. And they're paying people to become Islam. 300 to 1,000 American dollars a month. You know, when you've never had $5 your whole life, and all of a sudden you're given $300 a month, you'll kill your neighbor if you're asked to. You will. Especially if you don't have faith in Christ. You'll, you'll do unusual things. You say, how, how could that be? How did the people who Jesus blessed every day end up crucifying Him? Those were the very people that one week earlier were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, and now they're the ones who crucified Him. So folks, we're sneaking in there. Pray for us that we can get the work accomplished. At this point, another unusual thing happened. This outpouring of blessing and this, this outpouring, so to speak, of persecution began to really be stepped up. And people were taken. And uh, I saw uh, something very unusual. I saw many penitentiaries all over the states of the, of the United States, especially concentrated in California. In the dream, I saw many, many uh, states, uh, state prisons. Uh, in 1983, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said uh, that, I, that He was allowing the devil to build prisons in the state of California that would eventually become detention centers for Christians. And that these prisons were being built in rural areas that were normally 15 to 25 miles off of any main highway. And I said, why would that be the case? And he said, so that those people could be taken in the night hours. I have a friend, a good friend named Alex. I won't tell you his last name until after the meeting if you'd like to know his name. He escaped the Hungarian Revolution. Two of his brothers were snatched in the middle of the night. He's never seen them since 1956. Why do we think that America can't have this happen to it? America is a godless nation. If the ancient foundations are, the, are removed, what shall the righteous do? I was on my way to conduct another business transaction and I ran into an individual. A very strange thing happened at this point. He was very, very excited and began to talk to me about something he had just experienced. I'm going to go fairly quickly with this so that we can uh, move along. This is a very poor rendering, but we are putting together a very uh, good rendering of this. This man has said to me, Ken, uh, I introduced myself to him. He was very excited. He said, have you got your identification mark? And I said, I don't know what you mean. What's an identification mark? He says, uh, they've just enacted a new identification mark. And by the way, this started with a voluntary implementation first. You, you, you did it voluntarily first. This man told me, you ought to get yours done real soon to avoid the hassle because soon everyone, they say, will have to have this to conduct business. Now, what I want to show you is this is a poor drawing because we, we weren't artists and I am a stick guy drawer, so <laughs> please bear with me tonight. I will explain what the one I saw looked like. On the web of the right hand, this individual had what looked to be like the sunburst of Mexico. Anybody ever see the sunburst of Mexico? You know, it looks like a sun with a face on it. That's what this kind of appeared like, except these, these rays right here, they didn't look like that at all. If you could picture in your mind the sunburst, and then all of a sudden, like a hologram, beams were coming out of it as rays, okay? This was another palm. This is upside down. I don't know why that happened. We made a mistake. Actually, I didn't do this, but I'll take responsibility because I don't want the, my friend to get the bad rap on this. I love that guy. So, yeah, I do. I don't want to tell about him. This hand actually was facing just like the right hand was here, the same direction. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was inside of this. And there was another emblem just like this one on this hand like you see in the web. Okay, this guy was very excited about this. He was very happy because he said, hey, we won't have to use these stupid cards anymore. At this point in the dream, we were already at the point of using cards to transact everything. You say, how do you know that this will happen? I hosted about 18 missionaries, high school missionaries from British Columbia three months ago at my house. Uh, and they're on their way to Mexico. They were bummed out because they couldn't use their Canadian smart cards in America. 
for convenience sake, Canada is getting rid of cash because the Canadians don't like carrying the loonies and the toonies. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Those are big heavy coins that are a pain in the rear end to carry around because they're very, very heavy. And so for convenience sake, they're implementing this process. Now, this, this mark, I want to tell you about it, was very strange to me at this point because uh, shortly uh, after the dream, actually, no, not shortly, uh, again, I want to get these dates correct for you, 1993, uh, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, take up the game of golf. And I said, that probably wouldn't be a good idea, Lord, because uh, you remember my temper in high school with golf, and I would probably lose my testimony on the golf course. <laughs> Are you sure you want me to play golf? He says, yes, I want to have you get relaxation and teach you about character. You need some. I said, okay, Lord, I'll do that. And so I began to take up golf, and like most other golfers, you either love it or hate it. I totally loved it. I dressed the part. I had the clubs, but I couldn't play. And so I would buy my golf balls at Kmart because they were very, very inexpensive there. If you go to the golf course, the same golf balls that Kmart has, ladies, you can bust your husbands tonight, too. When they try to tell you that, you know, those golf balls cost 35 bucks, you can get the same ones at Kmart for about $12. Okay, and I would buy the real cheap ones because I played on very nice courses because I like to hang around really nice people and uh, I didn't have a good golf game and so I would lose about six or eight balls around. Anyway, I'm at Kmart and uh, I hope if you work at Kmart you're not mad at me tonight but what I'm going to tell you is a shocker and it's been confirmed now in four cities on the tour. I went up to pay for my golf balls and as I put them down on the counter I looked down and noticed this very unusual pad on the checkout counter. You know how you go to the grocery store where they weigh the vegetables and stuff, the little pad there? Well at this Kmart there was a little like about the size of this uh, overhead tonight about an eight and a half by eleven gray colored pad with a hand sitting down on it with the not that not exactly that because again that's a, a very poor rendering we will get the new rendering out by the way Stan was telling me uh, we'll get it to you um, but I saw this exact rendering that I saw in the dream sitting on this 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 uh, pad excuse me I asked the lady can you please tell me what this is all about and she said, I'll have you know that uh, they just recently put these in and we're not exactly sure uh, what is, is, is going to happen with them because they didn't tell us everything. She said, but a supervisor told me that what they're planning to do is sometime in the future just have a person run their hand by and that will take care of the scanning. Somebody might be here tonight that's seen these same handprints on these pads and some retail outlets. I've heard they've been seen in, in Walmarts and some other, I don't know the names of East Coast stores. Somebody was telling me some the other day that they were found in. And another thing they told me was exactly what happened to me. I began to witness to this lady, by the way, and uh, was able to, I, I wish I could have told you I led her to faith in Christ, but I wasn't, but I shook her to the core of her being. <laughs> I, I told her some things about the Antichrist, about the mark of the beast, and then I told her a few things about her mom and dad and her home life and all that. And uh, she didn't want to accept Christ, and the lady in line with her big bag of popcorn was getting a bit irate with me. So, but I'll have you know that she got rattled. And uh, about two weeks later, it was gone. And some people told me, yeah, we're seeing him come and go. It's kind of weird how it's happening. Uh, you know, uh, that very strange thing happened to me. Uh, anybody else want to see this anymore? It's a great drawing, isn't it? It's one of the most famous drawings that have ever come out of the Prophecy Club. This really rattles Stan because, you know, he's a perfectionist and he likes everything just right for you all. And uh, so we were there. At this point, uh, I saw a very, very, again, unusual thing that with this man's hand, this agitation. I got very frightened, and something spoke inside of my stomach and said to me, Get out of here as fast as you can. And I began to think, Oh my goodness, it is the end of the world now. It is really the end of the world. At this point, I began to run to my house as fast as I could. While I was running, I want to read to you what I heard in my spirit. I didn't know it was my spirit at that time. If you have a Bible, if you want to turn there tonight, <clears throat> I'll read very quickly from Revelations 13. I didn't know these were scriptures. I was hearing this inside of my stomach. Now, again, I didn't know what the stomach did at that time. Now I know that's where your spirit man lives. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. 
He causes all, verse 16, chapter 13 of Revelations, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, to receive uh, a mark in their right hand or their foreheads that no man might buy or sell, save that he has the mark, the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. That number is six hundred and three score and six, okay? Or, yeah, three score and six. Now, I'm running as fast as I can back to my house because I'm realizing, oh my gosh, my wife is there. She's alone. I'm getting to my house. Another scripture jumps into my heart. Didn't know it. It was from Matthew 24 about the abomination of desolation. I reached to the doorknob. I began to pull the door open, even though that scripture was telling me, don't go into your house, don't return. I opened it up to see the most demonic presence I've ever seen. This presence that I encountered at my front door as I opened the door, uh, I can't tell you that it was the devil himself. He uh, was very dark. There was a uh, shroud of black around him. It wasn't like, a, say, an African-American skin or anything like that. It wasn't skin that was dark. It was a shroud of darkness that was over this uh, being. This being was very sinister looking and just his presence gripped my heart with great fear. Uh, at this point I began to scream as loud as I could and I woke up from the dream. As I woke up I was uh, laying in a pool of perspiration. I literally had a silhouette of my body in the bed and I shook my wife and I said something terrible is happening to me and I, I think God is trying to tell me something. And so I told her a few things about what had happened and she said no, no, you're just having a nightmare. And, you know, I got to tell you, I knew this was no nightmare. I've had nightmares. How many have had nightmares? This was not a nightmare. There's no way. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. I think it was about 10.30 at night when I fell asleep. This had been going for several hours. And I felt a real strong urging to read the Bible, even though I didn't even know if I owned a Bible. I began to search in my garage for a Bible. I eventually found a Bible. It, uh, it said, uh, Holy Bible, St. Joseph Catholic Edition. And I don't even know where I got it. I opened the inside cover and it said, Property of St. Francis School and Church. <laughs> I don't know how it got to my house. I don't honestly remember stealing the Bible, but I guess I must have because I had it. I went back into the house, I sat down in a rocking chair and began to read this Bible uh, with, with diligence. Uh, I have a real habit in my life to always flip to the back of things and I flipped to the back of the Bible and it said Apocalypse. I have to tell you, I don't know what Apocalypse meant at the time. I had no idea what it meant. I began to read and, and all I could get out of what I was reading was that Jesus was going to come to his church and take away their candles. As a Catholic, that was very frightening to me because everything we did was with candles. You know, you, you had an Advent candle, a Lent candle, a, a Easter candle, a Christmas candle. You lit candles on the platform. You know, I mean, everything. You had purgatory candles. Everything was candles. And so uh, it made no sense to me. And I fell asleep. And instantly the dream began to start exactly where it left off. Me facing this very sinister creature. I, I think the creature uh, was a demon, uh, some sort of a demon presence. Uh, it was very, very intense and it gripped my heart. I slammed the door and ran off. I realized that my wife, in fact, wasn't in my home and that she was gone. I knew that by this presence. Um, it, it, it's, it's just hard to tell you how afraid I was. Uh, I've had a few experiences in my life with demons and witches manifesting in my hotel rooms and astral projecting in the soulish realm into my house and, and I've learned how to combat those kind of things. I'm not afraid of that anymore. Uh, they don't usually fool with me anymore because I, I know how to pray now. And, uh, but at this time, I had no comprehension of how to deal with this, this strong, strong evil being. And so I began to run, and I ran and ran and ran. I seemed to believe in my mind. In the dream, I ran a couple miles. And uh, I got caught by one of these strange-looking police trucks, uh, by these uh, p uh, military police. They knew my name. Even though I didn't tell them my name, they knew my name. And they took me to this uh, government building, 
It was a large building and uh, took me into a room and there was my wife and the older gentleman that I began to call the evangelist. They had uh, been captured and they knew exactly where to take me. That was very astounding to me because I wondered, how did they, how did they know all this stuff about people? You know, I know that we're watched right now. I know that Christians are monitored in our country. I know that Bible-believing Christians are monitored. The FBI monitors Bible-believing Christians. It's been happening for years and years. It's, recently, there was a printout in major papers that described what the FBI considered dangerous people. One of the uh, categories was Christians who are Bible-believing, regular church attenders that believe what the Bible says is relevant for today. Those are threatening individuals to the FBI. And so they knew things about us, and they took us into this room. I was in there with the, my wife and this older gentleman. They began to politely interrogate us. Uh, they began to ask us to, you know, be cooperative, come into this agreement with this new government, and everything will be fine for you. Well, my wife, uh, who you'll meet if you uh, come to meetings in the future, is one of the boldest Christians I've ever met. She's also probably one of the kindest and most gentle believers I've ever met. But she will get in the devil's face. And she and this older man began to preach to these uh, people that were trying to convince us of this uh, new uh, alignment of this government. And uh, so they took us out of there and put us in another room. And now it was uh, a lot of mind control interrogation. Uh, what happened was, in my mind, I could feel pulled in almost to this uh, uh, order and say, you know, if we just don't cause any trouble, it'll be okay. That's how my mind began to function. But yet uh, the older gentleman and my wife began to... Um, just fight this with, uh, with all their spiritual strength and challenge it with scriptures. Um, it was amazing to me um, because the, the, um, the capturing uh, of us was um, uh, almost as though they had planned it out. You know, I don't know how this being got to my house and, and how they knew to catch me, but it seemed like uh, it was being planned out. Some strange things that I saw right before this happened to me was that all the nations of the world were as one. There was no longer any sovereign individual nations. Continents were no longer uh, divided into countries, but continents were divided into regions. And uh, one thing I want to tell you about this time, that the awareness of God being on the global scene at this time was nearly impossible to detect. The global order had no presence of God in it whatsoever. A evil at this point in the dream had begun to pervade every aspect of society. Darkness was everywhere, and I was telling Stan this, that what I saw was there was a clear line of who was God's people and who wasn't. I mean, you could walk down the street and you would know instantly who was who. It's not like it is right now, whether you're wondering if, you know, sometimes you go into large groups of people and you're wondering, I wonder who's saved here. I wonder who knows the Lord. This was so evident. There was a clear line of delineation. Demarcation was marked uh, spiritually and was clearly seen. When, when we were being interrogated, uh, the, the mind control was uh, phenomenal. It wasn't like any human could do uh, in an interrogation. Uh, my mind began to really be swept with, with uh, uh, anxiety and fear. And then uh, because my wife and this older gentleman kept being very bold and kind of in, in your face with them, they took us out and they took us into this very, very long corridor. In this corridor was thousands of people lined up. It, the corridor, uh, it seemed to be at least a hundred yards long, probably longer. But in my ability, in, in depth perception in the dream, it was a long, long line of people. And every five or six minute, minutes, excuse me, these people would walk forward and take a step. We had been in this line for a long time when people would barge in through the doors on the side of this corridor and begin to grill people and tell them to renounce their faith. They would never use the name Jesus. They would never use the name Jesus Christ. They would never use the name God. But they would say, you should renounce your faith in Him while you can still live. And your faith is empty. And it was a blasphemous kind of... Uh, uh, 
challenging that these people were bringing against the people in the line and every so often somebody would crack they would just collapse and and they would drag them away and they would renounce their faith in Christ it, it, it made me very very uh, uneasy to be in this line because I wasn't quite sure what they were gonna do to us I wasn't sure if they were gonna put us in prison or maybe beat us up to scare us or or what it wasn't made clear yet to us Eventually, we made it through a battery of three double doors. After the last double door, we were put into like a holding cell kind of a room. And there was the old man uh, in the front of the line, my wife, and then myself. And they opened the doors very quickly and took this older gentleman into the room. And uh, I don't know what happened to him at this point of the dream because they shut the doors very quickly. Oh, six minutes or so later, they opened the doors this time wide open. And what I saw was uh, the most empty feeling I think I've ever experienced in my whole life. I saw this man that was a very, very big man. I, I, was, I was sharing uh, earlier in the tour that he was tall like a, a professional basketball player, but he was very uh, big like a professional football player. He was an extremely large uh, man, and he had a big uh, hood, like a satin hood, over his head with eye holes uh, to see out of. My wife was in front of me, and they began to tell her she could renounce her faith and, and live. And now I realized what was happening, because this man was standing there with a huge sword. I probably should have drawn a little transparency tonight to show you what the sword looked like. But uh, to, to, to trace it kind of in the sky, so to speak, it, it, it started down here with a handle and began to come up like this, and then like this, and then a big arch like this. And it was a very, very frightening looking sword. And then I saw this table that was a little bit longer than the average human being and a little bit wider. And they str my wife said she wasn't going to renounce her faith in Jesus. She began to preach powerfully. And, uh, you know, I wish, I wish even today I was as bold as her right now because I'm not. And she began to uh, just rebuke the devil, and you name it, I mean, she was doing it. And so they got angry and strapped her down on this table. By the way, it was like this, face first. So she was looking up to the sky with this man standing behind her with this sword. He took the sword and chopped her head right off, right in my presence. I saw it. I don't want to tell you that I want this to happen to my wife. I don't know if this will happen. I've never heard clearly God tell me that I would die as a martyr yet. I know that everything in the dream so far has transpired almost exactly as I saw it. But what happened was with this sword, it, it, it left an indelible mark in my life. Many years after the dream, I was participating in a uh, county fair. I was actually uh, visiting it in a place up in California. Uh, at Visalia and I was watching a parade and there was a bunch of older guys riding little motorcycles and zooming around and they had vests on and little caps it, it was uh, kinda strange to me I didn't really know how it fit in but afterwards I was walking down a side street and there was a big big van a big cargo van and it said please support uh, children's hospitals the Shriners etc etc and then all of a sudden it, it had this cap that these guys were wearing and the sword that I saw this executioner holding. I just sat there and froze when I saw this sword. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't know how to, to, to take it. I didn't know how to perceive it. It was, uh, it just emptied me out of all my ability to, to think really clearly. When I left that fair, I went and started studying out because I thought the Shriners were pretty nice people. I mean, they had nice hospitals and you know, they helped a lot of crippled kids and that kind of stuff, and I had no idea, but something told me that this sword uh, was connected to them somehow, and I began to research them, and I found out that they, in fact, are involved in quite a bit of some, some dark, dark things, and I found that the, the little cap that they wear, the fez, is red because they've promised to dip it in the blood of Christians because of the anger and animosity towards the Crusades where the Christians uh, killed lots of uh, Muslims and Jews. The other thing is the sword, and it's called the Sword of Scimitar. And uh, I searched this out, and it was the exact sword that this individual was using to execute people. I had just witnessed my wife being executed. 
And uh, I was very grieved, but to be very truthful with you, I was more afraid of what was going to happen to me next than the fact that my wife had just died. And I know that sounds very selfish, but if I told you any differently, I'd be lying and God would, would deal with me. I was more concerned about my life than her dying right then. I was very, very afraid. And I knew that now, now I'm going to die. And I knew that in my mind, I, I could not do this. I, I was not going to make it. I, I was paralyzed. And my mind began to torment me and almost became literally blanked out. My stomach began to shout out loud that, Jesus, please help me. I'm afraid. But the message couldn't get out because my mind was paralyzed. And it was as though I had the flu, an extreme case of the flu. My teeth were chattering and I was shaking with, with uh, chills in this line. I could not process my thoughts whatsoever. It was, as, it was as though that I had totally lost all faculties of my uh, mind, my ability to, to cognitively uh, be aware of what was going on at that moment. It was terrible, and although uh, it only lasted for maybe five or six minutes, it seemed like hours because of the extreme weight of this attack on me. I know a lot now, more than what I did in the dream, about the assaults of Satan and how he can work. But during this dream, I had no idea. I began to really try to cry out in my stomach. All I can tell you is I knew it was my spirit now, but in the dream it was just a war in my stomach and my mind. And finally it's as though something penetrated out of my stomach into my mind and I was able to spiritually call on Jesus and say, I'm afraid Jesus, please save me, help me. At the very instant that uh, communication spiritually happened, I felt a hand grip my shoulder. And again, it's very unusual because uh, for a brief period of time, I was more interested in the hand gripping me than actually what was happening to me. As soon as this hand gripped me, I got very warm and the chills left me. And it was as though my mind could now see and kind of comprehend clearly what was going on. I, I'll never forget the hand. It was a very rugged looking hand. And uh, it looked as though it had been through uh, a great deal of work. Almost, you know, like a, 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 a man who's a blue-collar worker that uses his hands like a mechanic or a builder or a plumber or something. It was a very rugged hand, and it was, it was a very thick hand. It wasn't like mine. You know, I'm kind of a small-boned person, but this was a very solid hand, and it gripped my shoulder, and warmth and peace began to flood through me. After a few moments, I turned back, and there was the Lord Jesus Christ standing behind me. I don't know how he got in that room because it was just a small holding cell and the doors behind us were shut. And then all of a sudden he looked me in the eyes. He looked at me very, very sternly. It wasn't uh, like a reproof or, or a conviction, but it was more of just him looking and peering into my life. And the most unusual thing occurred to me at, a, at the very instant I looked at him, it, his eyes were not brown or green or blue or anything like that. They appeared to be red like fire. And, and they were just looking clearly through my whole life. Somehow at that moment I was able to realize that him looking at me was actually looking through me and he knew everything of me. He knew my strengths. He knew my weaknesses. He knew every lie deep down inside of me. He knew every deception. He knew every place that I was afraid and I had compartmentalized. My whole being... Uh, by him looking into me was exposed to me. It was very frightening. It was, very, um, it was a very intense moment. Uh, I wish I could say that seeing Jesus at that moment made me very happy. It didn't. It made me very fearful. I understand now what the fear of the Lord is because of that experience. I've had the Lord visit me three times in my life, the resurrected Christ, and each time he's manifested himself, it was never a tiptoe to the tulips for me. It was always, I wanted to hide under the carpet because, am I here to die? What are you going to do? What do you want from me? It was a powerful uh, uh, manifestation of Jesus. It was not this, we're pals and buddies kind of a thing. I did not see that. I saw him in his awesomeness. And when he looked through me, he knew everything about me. He knew every nook and cranny. And about a, a few moments after realizing this, realizing my own depravity, he spoke to me and he looked sternly into my eyes and he said, Fear not, my son, for death will never hold you. This was unusual to me. And then instantly it was like a, a kind of a courage flooded through me. I wish I could tell you that I got very bold and preached a great sermon and got everybody saved. But I didn't. 
It was just courage to go through what was before me. And so these men strap me down now. And this uh, individual, uh, by the way, before they strap me down, they asked me one more time, you can renounce him now. And I said, no, he's the Lord of all. And I, 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 I knew that he had saved me in the dream because of the prayer and the thing with that older man. But when, he, when I looked at him, I knew now, and I can tell you folks, I know for a certainty, he is the Lord of Lords and the king of every king. Amen. And I'm telling you where the scriptures say every knee will bow, every tongue will confess his lordship, whether in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. When I saw him, there is not one knee, there is not one tongue that will not confess his lordship, regardless of what side of the coin they are, when he reveals himself to them. Every knee will bow. Trust me. Because this presence that he stood in was so powerful, so awesome, so anointed, so um, uh, terrible, so to speak. Like the scriptures say, he's terrible in his presence. Terrible in the sense that you knew that there's no power on earth that could challenge him. Folks, I, there, I'm not afraid of nuclear bombs at all. I have no fear of nuclear uh, disaster. Because I know that the God of the universe that revealed himself to me is greater than any demonstration that man can concoct. The creator of heaven and earth gave us the wisdom to make those stupid bombs. He is not going to be outdone by his creation. And I saw that about him. And then they strapped me down and they said, you can renounce him. And I said, no, I can't renounce him because he's the Lord of all. And he should be your Lord. That was my great sermon. I wish, you know, it could have been a lot longer. But probably if I would have got going any more than that, I would have messed it up like just about everything else. That's why I have this on an outline because it's 20 years old. Even though I, I can relive points of it right now and I, I have purposely asked tonight, Dor the Lord tonight, please don't let me bawl up here. Please don't let me weep and cry. Because what I saw happen to my wife, it, it gripped me and it still grips me to this day. And I have seen my wife literally become this person that lived in this dream. When, they, when this man cut my head off, as soon as the very instant I saw the sword coming down and it touched my neck, the moment that the blade touched my neck, I was gone. I felt no death whatsoever. And all of a sudden, I was up, in, it wasn't a ceiling as this high, but it was quite high. And I was standing there and again holding a person's hand and I was looking down upon the scene. And it was very grotesque, and, and I don't know why I was shown it this way, but I'm going to tell you exactly what I saw from the beginning to the end. My head was cut off, and I was bleeding profusely. It was very, very strange. And even though this hand was holding me, I didn't know who it was. I was actually more interested in seeing me dead there than, than the fact that I was actually delivered from the death. And then all of a sudden, I looked down and realized, my gosh, it's another one of these rugged hands holding my hand. And I, I looked up and it was the Lord again, the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, it doesn't matter what you go through here. It doesn't matter what trial you're experiencing. And I don't know why the Lord doesn't choose to show everybody himself. I don't know. I have no idea why he showed me this. I was a sinner. I was not even interested in following him. I didn't ask for this. I, I'm not worthy of receiving anything where he showed himself to me. And, and I can tell you that whatever trial you go through, even if it's being brought to a point where you have to lay down your life, it is worth it. Yes, because of what I saw in my Savior. At this point now, it went from a stern, powerful, all-knowing God to a God who was holding my hand that gave me the understanding that now I was his son, I was his brother, I was his brethren, that he was not ashamed to call me his brethren. And I had an understanding all of a sudden that I was equal with him, not as God, the deity, not as Jesus, the son, but as a son of God, not the son of God, the first begotten, the only begotten, but a son, you know, not a God, because the scriptures clearly tell us we're created a little lower than the angels. But there was an equality in the sense that we were brothers now. And that it no longer was a fearful thing for me to stand in his presence, but there was immense acceptance. Folks, there was immense understanding. I had clear understanding of things now that I can preach with great fire, like the scripture that says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I never weep at funerals ever since this dream. Never. Because I know in the presence of the living God that when his children are, are coming through death, it's precious to him.
I saw him take me through death. I saw him spare me this, 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 this feeling of death even though I died. And then when he, he gathered me into his bosom, so to speak, in the death, he showed me that as the scripture says, it doesn't appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Folks, at that moment, I was like Jesus. In image, in, in faculty, in understanding, I could not longer, any longer, excuse me, any longer see any of my weakness. None of my frailties were known to me any longer. I was completely delivered out of all of that. Truly, to be in the presence of the Lord is to be like Him. Folks, it's worth it. You know what? It's worth laying down this life and all of its pleasures and all of its goals and all of its aspirations just to gain Christ. I know what Paul meant now when he said, I will have considered it all loss to gain Christ. I completely understand that now. It's not hidden from my understanding anymore. And each time that he's come to me, I've been translated several times, each time he's come to me, the understanding gets more and more powerful of the value of being hid in Christ Jesus. And all of a sudden, the man with the, the hood pulled off his hat, his covering, and threw it down and said, I will not kill another one of these people. And then the dream was over. I woke up. It was 5.30 in the morning. I was just completely in shock. Although I understand now everything in the dream, when I woke up, I didn't understand it. I took it to a Christian man that I knew, seven pages of this dream, front and back, and said, I know you're holy. I know you're a real man of God. I've been tormenting you for a long time. I know that you're a real Christian. Will you please tell me what this means? He read the first two pages, and he looked at me and said, you better get saved, man. And you better get saved right now. And I said, what save mean? I'd never heard the word saved. He says, you need to be born again by the Spirit of God. I'd never heard the word born again, folks. I was a Roman Catholic. Not once in my whole life did I ever hear the word being born again or salvation or saved in one church service. And I said, do I have to be like you? And he said, kind of yes, kind of no. And I said, look, man, you know how I live. I like to have fun. And you, it doesn't seem to me you ever have fun. You come to work an hour early. You leave an hour late. You're too holy for me. He says, Ken, he says it's worth it. And I said, look, just tell me, do, do I have to quit doing everything I do right now? You know, like having fun, having a couple drinks at lunch, you know, at the bar, things like that. You know, slipping those Playboy centerfolds into your price book to, to freak you out every so often. He said, Ken, kind of yes, kind of no. I said, man, I don't have a clue what you're saying. And I left him very, very discouraged and angry. For two weeks, my life went into total misery. Absolute, miserable state of being. I'd have killed myself if I would have believed that Catholics could make it to heaven. But we were taught if you killed yourself, you're straight to hell. And so I didn't do that. Everything happened that you could imagine. I lost money. You name it, it happened. Sambos went bankrupt on me. I lost a whole lot of money. Everything that could happen went bad until my best friend that was in the Marine Corps came to my house and told me an experience that he had had. And he got arrested in the Marine Corps for stealing a bus and joyriding on Waikiki Beach while under the influence of marijuana. He tried to parallel park a 40-passenger bus and wreck two or three cars. <laughs> he got put into the brig. He was arrested and being charged with a court-martial and facing a dishonorable discharge. He was given a little transistor radio in the brig. And in the brig, one night, about 2 o'clock in the morning, he was e evaluating his life. He had gotten his girlfriend pregnant in high school. We were all three. Another friend of mine were going to join the buddy plan. I bailed out at the last minute. They both joined. One went to the Persian Gulf during the Carter administration and nearly thought that they were going to have to nuke Iran. And uh, he said to me, well, Ken, I had this little radio, and I'm, I'm, I'm evaluating my life, and I'm realizing I've pretty much ruined my whole life. And I didn't know how to change that fact. I have a child I can't father. I'm a drug addict, blah, blah, blah. And he says, all of a sudden, I turn on the radio. I couldn't get anything but one station. Nothing would come in. This is Los Angeles, folks. There's hundreds of stations in Los Angeles. Only one station would work on this dumb transistor radio, he said. And it was a Christian station. And some stupid preacher was preaching on there. And he said, Ken, it was some monotone preacher telling me that you know, you could be in the brig right now. Perhaps you're in the bunk and you could kneel down and ask Christ into your heart right now. And he said, what? And he says, God, if that's you, then tell me one more time. If you're really God and that's really you talking to me, tell me one more time. And the man said instantly on the radio, like I said, 
You could be in the brig. You could be in the bunk. Kneel down right now and ask Christ into your heart. You know what my friend did? He kneeled beside his bunk and he asked Christ into his heart. And he's telling me this story. And he says, I, wanna, I want you to go to church with me this morning. I found a real good church. And that's why I haven't been coming and visiting you. Would you please come to the church service with me? I said, no way, man. I'm a Catholic. I'll die a Catholic, born a Catholic, that deal. I'm not going to no church with you. And he made a bet with me that if I didn't like it, he'd go back to the Catholic church. I went to this church and I experienced the most unusual things of my whole life. It shook me to the core of my being. A great big galoot of a man hugged me at the front door of the church, <laughs> told me he loved me, and he called me his brother. And I just about smacked him. I was so angry inside. I said, look, something wrong with you? You weird or something? You know, I said some other explicitives that I can't uh, repeat tonight. Stan would never have me back if I said that. Not to mention, I'd have to do some serious repentance. I'd never been hugged by a man since I was an infant. We were men's men. We didn't hug. We shook hands. We didn't cry. And this man's telling me he's loving me, and I'm cussing him out, saying, you don't love me because you don't know me, and you're not my brother. My brother's Ke uh, Keith and Eric. Now get away from me, you strange-o, before I give you a little knuckle sandwich, pal. I was a very angry person at that point in my life, and I would have done it with no problem at all. And I tell you right now, I'm still not afraid of big guys. I was a, 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 a master in some martial arts practices, and I didn't have a problem thumping somebody. And I was about to thump this guy, and I told my friend, what kind of a weird place are you bringing me to? And all of a sudden, in the church service, all these people are dancing around, raising their hands, speaking in some sort of a Latin that I never heard of. It was the strangest thing I ever experienced, and I just was freaking out. I'm in the balcony of this old Fox Theater, and all of a sudden, you know, the preacher preaches. He's sweating like a pig. He's running around with a cordless mic like Stan was using tonight, like some sort of an entertainer, you know, with a Bible. And I'm thinking, what? What has my friend gotten himself into? Then they took this offering, and he's throwing cash in there, and I'm thinking, you've lost it, man. You have really lost it. And I mean, I was miserable. And all of a sudden, this man took this time, and he says, we're going to have an altar call. The Lord's showing me something about a young man that's here today. And so I'm up in this balcony, I'm thinking, huh. All of a sudden, he says, every head bowed, every eye closed. Please, saints, begin to pray. Saints? There's no saints here. What do you mean? <laughs> No St. Teresa, no St. Anthony that finds all my lost stuff, no St. Joseph, no St. Mary here, no saints here. What are you talking about? Man, that was like sacrilegious calling somebody a saint. Saints were in heaven, man. They're the only ones who made it. St. Peter, you know what I mean? And I'm thinking, saints, and all of a sudden, everybody started bowing their heads and closing their eyes and started speaking in Latin or French or something. I don't know what it was. Shikami, shikami, some sort of business. I have no idea what it meant. It freaked me out. And he starts describing this young man, and the young man is me. And he starts talking about me personally. He starts describing my life to this whole crowd of people. About 2,000 people in this church service. And I'm up in this balcony, I'm thinking, man, who's this guy talking about? And all of a sudden I start realizing, this guy's getting pretty close to home right now. And I'm thinking, my friend, I bet you my friend told this guy about me. And my friend had his head bowed, and he was doing the shikimi shikimi stuff. And I'm watching all this, and I, I'm, my mind is warring again, just like in my dream. It's telling me, get out of there and get out of there quick. Run. You can leave now. You can make it. Kind of like renounce him almost, you know. And I, I just tell you, folks, I was glued to that theater seat. I could not get up. I was white-knuckling the handles. And all of a sudden, he says, young man, he's, he's doing this for about 10 or 15 minutes. He says, young man. God recently spoke to you in a dream about the end of the world, the tribulation. He showed you in detail, graphic details, about the end and your end. Oh, man, all of a sudden I'm realizing this guy is talking about me. And inside I ask this question, who is it? Who is it? And I hear this, it's you. And I thought the person behind me had talked. And I turned back to look at him, and they were doing the shikimi, 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 shikimi. And I'm thinking... Man, this is really, really, really weird. And my mind kept telling me, run, get out of there fast. Look, folks, I was a hippie. I was a long, curly hair, beach bum looking, troublemaking, you know, ornery cuss with a lightning bolt t-shirt on, Budweiser, Tecate, Ensenada, bike race. I mean, I was the pit. I was from the pit. I was totally lost. And he starts describing the dream, and then he finally says, Young man, how do you know that if today was your last day on earth, that you would make it to eternity with Jesus Christ, because it's either heaven or hell? And all of a sudden, I started thinking again, and my, my stomach asked this question again, Who is it? And I heard this voice say, It's you. And I said, It's me? 
And he said, it's you. And all of a sudden, the lights came on, and the voice that said, it's you, was the same voice that looked me in the eyes and said, fear not, for death will never hold you. And all of a sudden, in this chair, I'm realizing, oh my goodness, this is Jesus talking to me. What do I do? And my mind was still warring at that moment. It was in terrible turmoil. All of a sudden, it's like the theater seat ejected me out. I'm not kidding you. You know, those seats, they go like this, and they push down. It should have ejected me back. And I'm standing up, and I'm thinking, uh-oh, I'm in big trouble now. And all of a sudden, my stomach was screaming, run to the front, run to the front fast. And so, I did. And the next thing I know, I'm in the front of this church, and I'm thinking, what am I doing here? And all these people, i got to tell you folks, uh, you could check my school records, I could never pass public speaking. I would have an accident in my pants. I was so shy and nervous. I could not look people in the eyes. When God told me I was going to be a preacher, I said, you definitely got the wrong guy. I'll be a plumber, I'll do anything you want me to be, but you're never going to get me to be a preacher. I'll get sick. I can't do it. My hands will sweat. I'll, I'll vomit. I'll have accident. You cannot call me to this. All of a sudden, I'm in front of this whole church, and I'm realizing, my gosh, every person here is staring at me. And all of a sudden, this preacher says to me, oh, praise the Lord. Would you like to be saved? Would you like to have eternal life? I said, look, I don't know why I'm down here. Please, just tell me what I'm here for. Something told me, run down here. He says, that's the Spirit of God. Jesus is wooing your heart and blah, blah, blah. And I pray the prayer, you know. I, I, I confess J Jesus is the Lord and that He's the Savior and et cetera, et cetera. And then he says, do you want to receive the Spirit of God? And or at first he, he prayed this prayer and, and I start crying. He's crying. Everybody's shouting and crying. And, and I'm thinking, why is everybody so excited about this? I don't understand this. I've never seen this happen, folks. I didn't know that you get excited when people get born into the kingdom. I had no idea. I've been lighting candles my whole life, man, praying, <laughs> praying masses for the dead. And all of a sudden, he says to me, I felt this clean, clean feeling. I just felt clean. I didn't feel dirty anymore. That's all I could tell you what happened to me when I got saved. I just felt clean. And he says, would you like to receive the Holy Spirit? And I said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, I, I don't even have any idea. He says, well, y you'll have the power of God. I said, fine, fine, whatever. I mean, I just feel clean. And he put his hand on my head. And the next thing I know, I'm doing the same thing as everybody else, the shikami, shikami, shikami thing. I can't stop it. And all of a sudden, from that point forward, that very day, that day, I began to know things about people again. Just like when I was young. I began to know when people would die. I would begin to know when I would go and help in the, the church's evangelism ministry and churches. I would know that people were sick and they'd get mad at me because I'd tell them words of knowledge. Well, I didn't know they were words of knowledge. I didn't know any of that. I thought everybody heard from God that way because now I was a Christian officially. And I began to know things about government. I began to know things about who would win elections and all sorts of crazy things. And so that's, that's what happened, literally in a nutshell. I want to take a moment and show you some things now that the Spirit of the Lord has given to me as future events that will begin to happen. If you can follow along with me uh, uh, to this point, uh, I want to give you some clear directions very quickly uh, that these are things that the Lord has shown me, had me prophesy publicly, different specific things. I, I believe it's not enough to give you a dream. You need to know what God's saying about future events. All countries that the United States of America has entered militarily outside of God's will, God is considered encroachment and will allow these nations to afflict the United States of America. If we don't begin to repent for a warmongering nation that we've become, God will afflict us with these nations. If you don't believe me, I'll tell you some things about North Korea. We went to North Korea in the 50s without the permission of God. We also went to Vietnam without the permission of God. The United States of America, clearly the Lord showed me this seven years ago, has until the end of 2003 to change its course back to God. If it fails to do so, God will judge the United States of America as a goat nation. You know that nations are judged in the kingdom of God. The Bible tells us that every tongue, every tribe, every nation... We are now in America's determined time. He revealed to me recently the, the, uh, the candidates that were running for the presidency of the United States of America. He showed me them in a dream before they even declared their candidacy. And he told me that three of them desired to be world rulers. One desires to rule on a national level. He said he'd exposed the first two. John McCain and Bill Bradley got exposed. He told me exactly how they would be exposed. One would challenge the Christian right. The other would try to bring into uh, liberal uh, education sectors all of John Dewey's realized visions. Both of them, he told me, would lose out before the election. I'm telling you, folks, we've got to pray like we've never prayed before. 
You say, well, how do you know this? I'm telling you, I've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophecies come to pass exactly as the Lord had me decree them. I am praying over these things daily. Judgment will soon begin on unrepentant cities in the United States of America. They'll either be regional blessing or regional judgment. In 1989, God gave me a vision of giant hailstones being projected from the heavens. They were not nuclear bombs. The Lord told me that. I asked him. He said, no, these are projectiles from heaven. I'm bringing either blessing in the spirit or judgment in the natural for unrepentant regions. He said, regions that will not repent, I will destroy them. And I saw these huge, almost uh, meteor uh, 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 stars size uh, flames of fire, hailstone, fire, fire hailstones being shot down and hitting total cities and absolutely annihilating every human being in the city. And the Lord spoke to me and said, this decade will start the release now. There'll be bl the other fire I saw hit regions and spread over rooftops, over churches, over neighborhoods, and all those regions became what I saw in the dream of those areas that began to burst forth with revival. Blessings of revival and harvest to regions responsive to the Holy Spirit direction to bring unity and love to cities. I told you about all Malanga, Guatemala. It's proof that God will win cities if we will walk in love and pray for unity. Psalm 133 says this, Oh, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. When us Pentecostal, Charismatic, Baptist, Methodist stop uh, fighting each other and cutting off our own arm in the body of Christ, and listen, Prophecy Club people, I'm going to bring you a rebuke from the Spirit of the living God. You didn't get this information about the end of the world so that you could be seclusive or exclusive in your knowledge. You were given this information by the Holy Ghost of God to save His people that are in deception. Abraham cried out, for Lot's deliverance because Lot was a deceptive, greedy man. He took an area when the Spirit of the living God showed Abraham that the herdsmen were fighting and Abraham stepped back and said, Lot, you choose. And Lot chose the most blessed looking area instead of esteeming Abraham who took him out of, out of a Padan Haram and brought him into a sojourning place, literally saved him and his greed led him to Sodom. And he lived in Sodom for years and his soul was vexed. But God showed him when judgment would come. He showed Abraham and Abraham began to intercede for wicked Lot. Lot was wicked, folks. He never left Sodom because the Bible tells us that his wife loved Sodom and so did two of his daughters and two of his son-in-laws. You are not given this understanding about the end time to be quiet. You're going to have to cause a little trouble in some churches and start telling the truth. I don't care what pastors and evangelists and teachers and prophets and apostles say. It's time that the living power of God flows through this revelation that you have. Not just in tapes and books, but through you as demonstrations that the end is upon us. It's now. And if you do not say this, then you will be judged according to Ezekiel's prophecy on 33. He said, if you see that something is coming disastrous and you warn no one and blow no trumpet, then blood will be on your hands. Folks, I just got kicked out of a denomination for standing on these positions. Twelve years of faithful ministry, down the pipe, ordination and everything, the whole boot of it gone. Because I'm making a choice to stand and make a declaration. I'm putting my life in jeopardy hanging out with you nutcases. <laughs> I'm willing to go to the Sudan right now and jeopardize my very well-being, believing that I'm hearing God say, somebody has to go that's willing. Yes. You're not being given this stuff so you can come to these meetings and be big fat heads and go to Denny's afterwards and say, well, now we know more. That's right. Somebody has to challenge the Church of America right now with the truth. Jesus was sent to rock a Pharisee order. You're living in the same Pharisee order, and what are you doing about it? Amen. It's time that change comes, folks. And I'm preaching at me, me too tonight. I'm preaching at myself because it's time that this thing changes. A lot of things are happening right now. We're in the time of the aligning of the nations. And in the early 90s, the Lord gave me a prophecy to give to a two-star general in the, in the Air Force. I called him out and specifically spoke into his life immediate things that came to pass, unbelievable things. And then God had me give him a prophecy about many nations. And he said, much of this we know in the Pentagon. And much of it is secret information. But he said, please, Ken, wherever you go, wherever you preach, tell the people of God, there's a minimum of 25 two-star and higher generals in the Pentagon that are born again, spirit-filled Christians that are praying that American Christians would pray for them because they're afraid if they get called to make decisions that could destroy the whole world, they wouldn't know how to act wisely. How many of you have thrown away our military and decided it's totally destructive? We've got men. God always puts a remnant somewhere, folks. 
He told me that Castro's replacement would make him seem as a kitty cat. God told me this in 1995. He said, I will do something and I will make Castro and the nation of Cuba known over the whole world by one instant. Little Elion is God's example right now. Not for a custody base, folks, a case. It's, it's for a reason to show us that 90 miles off the coast of Florida, you could be nuked in a matter of minutes. Are we praying? Are we interceding? Are we really standing in the gap? Africa and South America will be born again continents, nations total, totally for Jesus. I can tell you some things that you don't know about the Islam nation pumping money into Sudan to destroy Africa because they do not want a, a Christian nation or a Christian continent. Why do you think your gas prices went up? They're pumping billions of dollars right now into the Sudan to destroy the Christ-like move of his spirit. America's debauchery-ruled regions will see more judgment. The homosexual agenda will launch an all-out attack with open opposition against Christianity. I asked the Lord many years ago, when will your wrath be poured on our nation? He said, read the book of Genesis, read about Abraham, it's simple. He said, I never judged Sodom until the Sodomites tried to take in their hands to harm my holy men of God. And, and Lot said, I'll offer you my two virgin daughters. No, we want those men. And as soon as they put their hands to harm those men, God brought judgment. And you have never heard in America yet about a homosexual killing any Christians, but you sure have heard of supposed Christians killing homosexuals. It's time that we get out of our self-righteous thinking and start sending love and unity into the body of Christ. And because if we don't, I'm telling you, judgment will hit us soon. This agenda is very angry right now, folks. They are very close to having a mishap. Right. America will adopt new laws and times. I was able to sneak into the White House spiritually in a vision. The Lord showed me the President of the United States with other foreign leaders planning to make new times and new laws. Even the Bible tells us in Daniel that someone will come and adopt new times and new laws. I said, Lord, what is this? He says, I'm not going to tell you. I want to see if you'll be faithful to pray. He told me we must pray to stop this. The church will lose its non-tax status. I'm going to move this up just a hair. More spiritual leaders will come under national exposure until God brings forth a righteous church. Clean. Uh, and, and, and clean, where am I? Clean without spot or blemish. One year before Jimmy Swaggart, brother Jimmy Swaggart fell, God told me, I'm going to bring him down if he doesn't repent of his ways of judging my people. He said, and I will use what book, the book of Proverbs says, that when a man falls into immorality, he's, found, he's been found wanting in the scales of righteousness. The Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. That man judged almost every one of his sermons, other ministries, other people of God, and God had to expose him. Why? Because God is going to bring forth a church that's clean without spot or blemish. I'm telling you, it's not time to play hokey pokey with the kingdom of God anymore, folks. It's not time to cheat your, uh, your, your churches with tithes and offerings. It's not time anymore to lie and have adulterous relationships. And men, I want to tell you something about promise keepers. I bet you don't know. When promise keepers first came out, cities hated it. And now they love it. You know why? Because it's a fact that pornography purchases in hotel rooms have tripled since they've come to town. Over 60% of American pastors are bound to internet pornography. Why? Because they're not accountable. They can go in their office and shut the door and turn on their computer and, and, and launch into uh, spiritual ecstasy with these, these images. See, before they had to go to a bookstore and they were afraid to get caught or they couldn't get a, a video at the video store because somebody might bump into them from church. It's time that we become a holy people again. More leaders in the government realm will be exposed to reveal our deceptions. Notice, not the nation's, our deceptions regarding character need in our elected officials. I was told the moment I dropped the ballot into the box when Clinton first ran that the Lord said to me, you voted for the wrong man, the other guy's going to win. And I said, why? He said, because he's not smart enough to enact a new order and the other man is. And my church isn't ready. If I was to allow this order to come now, most of my people would perish. He also told me he would win a second election. He also told me he would expose him like Nebuchadnezzar to the whole earth and to bring, bring him into craziness to find righteousness. How many of you are praying that he becomes righteous? Judgment's coming on the mortgage business. Bombings will increase on U.S. soils towards unrepentant cities. I saw bombings happen seven years before a bombing ever hit New York or, or Oklahoma City. Earthquakes will continue, however, with greater magnitude and destruction and loss of lives, even on U.S. soil. I saw both the 1988 quake and I saw in the spirit a quake. I didn't understand it when the Lord first brought it to me about the Northridge quake. I thought, I thought it was a spiritual quake. And then he began to show me the word clearly. I wrote it out. I can send it to you if you want it. And he said, 
said, Ken, if my people don't repent, if my people who are called by my name will not humble themselves and fast and pray and seek my face, I will bring my judgment and I'll bring it now. Judgment's coming on the mortgage business. God showed me, and we'll pray about this later, that if you have a mortgage, you better get in line and stop paying on a 30-year plan because the Bible says the only length of debt that it was ever allowed was seven years. I've got a supernatural sign from God that God has began to honor His Word in different places where people said, God, I'll pay off my mortgage in seven years. And God said to them, I'll bring you extra finance as long as you apply it to debt. I'll supernaturally pay it off. And you will be, if you will be faithful in three, over, over a three-month period, I will pay your mortgage off in three and a half years. We've heard of hundreds of times of God paying off people's mortgages. Why? Because he's going to judge the mortgage business because God is a good steward with his money and he doesn't want you paying for a house or me three and a half or four times for one house. He'd rather give you three and a half or four houses. That's right. Earthquakes are going to continue. This will be a year that will have a massive quake in the United States of America. It will take millions and thousands of lives, not millions, excuse me, thousands. And if we don't begin to repent, it will ha it'll hit this year and will bring massive destruction, massive, the greatest that America's ever experienced. This decade will release the greatest amount of famine, pestilence, floods, and disasters ever in the history of man. All will happen with repetition, seemingly without a slowdown, one after another. I was revealed El Nino weather many years before it happened with some unusual, unusual El Nino currents that came up into California from Mexico that brought giant tunas, almost 3,000 pound bluefin tunas, and God showed me through the greed that he was going to use a storm named El Nino to destroy the farmers because they haven't repented of their ways of raping his ground. And he said, I'll take topsoil from American farmers. Let me get to the last page. Riots and violence will be unleashed upon lawless regions, especially those regions that scorn God and His ways, in the United States and worldwide. More shootings will occur this year and in the next two years, and martyrs will happen on American soil until a church begins to pray. Remember when James was killed and Herod got excited and the people stirred their hearts and he put Peter in prison? Peter didn't die because it said the church began to pray. How many more martyrs do we need to die on American soil before we get smart and start praying seriously? Mainline churches will completely die off from the results of gross compromise. When churches begin to ordain homosexual pastors and lesbian pastors, God is going to put his hand down, folks. And he told me, it's not just that, so don't become homophobic, he said, son. He says, because I'm going to tell you another reason I'm going to judge my church, and I'm going to judge some very famous people that are on the television because they've taken my message of grace and they've trampled it under their feet. They say, oh, I can divorce my wife because God wants me happy. You're not married in Christ to divorce your wife. You better die to your flesh and get your marriage straightened out so that you're not under the judgment of the living God. Right. We've played patty cake with grace far too long. We've trampled Jesus underfoot. Yes. 1994, God gave me a dream of, of the sports, a God of sports, entertainment, and idols. I don't know if I told you this earlier. O.J. Simpson, uh, Princess Diana, and Mother Teresa, all the major idols, not the person itself, the image of them, brought down in a five-year period. Boom, boom, boom. And he says, I'm going to do more. I'm going to do more. And he says, and he says uh, to fall. And I don't know why that 1999 is there. It's before the end of 2000. It's a misprint. He says, more, or, or I know why it's there. He said, before the fall of 99, he this would happen. And by the way, it did. Uh, Princess Diana and Mother Teresa died in 98. He told me more would follow. Judgment on America's farmers for failing to enthrone the God of harvest. He said, I'm going to take America's topsoil unless they, unless they repent. Here's how you begin to prayer, prepare. Let me move this up. Number one, stay out of consumer debt. How many people here tonight would admit openly that you have consumer debt? Why would banks send you five or six credit card applications a month when you could charge all those available charges and never in your whole life be able to pay off all the cards that they could send you? Why would banks operate that way, folks? The Lord showed me a debtor's prison. They're launching us right in. Leave the Babylonian system, the God of, of prosperity and destiny and the Babylonian system, according to Isaiah 65, 8 through 15. I should have put those scriptures. It's not very professional the way I wrote it out. I'm sorry. If you look at verse 11, you have to study it out. The King James actually has an incorrect translation there. It says troop and number. It's actually Gad and Mini, not Gad, the troop of the Israelites, but Gad, the Babylonian God of prosperity and destiny. Think about it for a minute. 
The America system has held you back from your God-given prosperity, spirit, soul, and body, and your God-given destiny. There's less than 10 people in this room tonight that are accomplishing their God-given destiny. You're not changing any generations of people. You've been robbed by Babylon. Return to your first love, Jesus Christ. Not to His Word, not prophecy, not gifts, but Him. Love your neighbor. Avoid the spirit of intolerance and hatred. Don't run after signs or you'll be deceived. Tear down idolatry now. Begin to fast and pray. Sanctify yourselves now. Don't be foolish virgins. Notice the par parable told us that they were virgins. What is a virgin? Somebody say it out loud. It's a person that's pure. Those were virgins that missed the coming of the Lord. They missed the visitation because they weren't prepared. They had no extra oil. Stop denying the Lord and share your faith every day. The Spirit of God told me, pastors and leaders and evangelists have told my people lies for many, many years that they can witness their life by just shining their light. He said, show me where that's in the Bible, son. He said, my son went out every day and witnessed the truth of the Father to everyone he encountered with a demonstration of the Holy Spirit. So did the disciples. Why is it now that we don't think we have to? Why are you afraid to share your faith? Why are you afraid to witness? Because you're under the grip of Babylon. Put your assets into gold and silver. I was sharing with, this, uh, with Stan and, and he gave me some clear direction. God had shown me uh, that these needed to be non-confiscated coins. Specifically, he told me at one time, uh, a, a certain region uh, of the world to buy coins. He told me, if you have assets, you need to put them in safe places right now. Because he told me six months ago, it'll be two years before the end of prosperity in the stock market. It's already shaking right now, folks, big time. Those are the trimmers. Another thing he told me, be very careful to tell my people to catch this one. Avoid more slick technology that gives away your personal power. What do you mean by that, Brother Ken? I mean, quit buying into these little things like mobile gas stations where you can take your little quick pass and get through and pay your gas. That's giving up your personal power. Another area is your spiritual life. Since when does a prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, apostle have the authority to tell you what you can and can't do in Christ Jesus? When does your pastor have the authority to tell you you can't minister the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's, that's taking your personal power from you, folks. You've all been called, according to the scriptures, as ministers of the New Testament grace. Every one of us. Isn't it amazing? We bought into Martin Luther's reformation of grace through faith, but we didn't take hold of the kingdom of the believers, the priesthood of every believer. We are more Catholic now in, in Protestant churches than the Catholics are. We're more dependent on our pastors than the Catholics are pretty sad. Don't give away your personal power that Jesus Christ gave to you. Number 10, don't fail to study God's Word. Keep your path lit. You know, God's people have lost their ability to study His Word faithfully. This is the light for our path and a lamp to our feet. How will you know what to do in the days ahead if you're not in His Word? And number 11, continually stand in the gap. Please, continually stand in the gap and begin to repent as Daniel did and God will hear us according to 2 Chronicles 7.14. Why don't you bow your heads with me and let's pray that God would move in our hearts once again and that we would truly become a prophetic, end-time, revelatory people. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you right now that you would move in our hearts and your people's lives. Change us, O oh Lord, tonight. Bring us to a place of understanding about why you've called us as Prophecy Club folks. You've shown us the end. You've shown us purposes. Give us clear direction in how to fulfill those things, Lord. I pray for every person here tonight, Lord. I pray that they would be shaken tonight by a hammer in your word that challenges them through these aspects. I pray, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that they will know the great power of your spirit that causes them to be your witness, that causes them right now, Holy Spirit, to lead them into all truth. I pray your blessings upon each and every one of them, Lord. They've been faithful to come. Even some have went through weather and from distances. They're hungry, Lord. Touch your people. As, as the Psalms would say, revive us, O Lord. Revive us, O Lord. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, the thing of it is, folks, that blood is for you. And as you're watching this videotape, you may be well be saying, all right, I see a lot of this already coming to pass. And it may be that by the time you watch the videotape, you're seeing a lot more of it come to pass. And you may be saying, how do I get this blood to wash my sins away? 
Well, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So let me give you an example. I'll take my watch off here, and I'll use uh, you as an example here. Now, I know you've already seen this. You're going to have to play on because you know exactly what to do. Here, no, I'm going to pick somebody else just for that. But if I were to say, I'll tell you what. If you sit there for another five minutes as I finish talking about this, I'll give you this watch. Is that a gift? No. That's a wage. She did something for it. But if I were to say, I'll tell you what. I'll give you this watch for a dollar. Is that a gift? No. That's a a wage, isn't it? That's no, excuse me, that's a bargain. <laughs> Just check and see if you're paying attention. But if I were to say, I tell you what, here, you can have the watch. <laughs> see, I'm waiting for her to reach out to, to take it. I'm ready to pull it back, you see. And that's what Jesus is doing to you every day of your life. He is holding out the gift of eternal life. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. It is a free gift. But just like her, when does the watch become hers? When she reaches out and takes it. But see, the difference is to say, I'm ready to pull it back. But Jesus is not. He holds out the gift for eternal life, every day of your life, and he's not pulling it back. All you have to do is reach out and take it. But you do have to reach out and take it. How do you reach out and take it? Romans 10, 9, and 10 gives the answer. It says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What's that saying? It's simply saying it's not enough to believe it and not say it. And it's not enough to say it and not believe it. We've got to believe it and we've got to say it. And like the talk tonight, we need to be willing to lay our life down for it. You may not be one of those that is lucky enough to win the highest crown. But if you are, you have to pray and ask for God to give you the strength. And I don't think flesh can give you the strength to do that. But I think through God, we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. What we need to do is be prepared to ask for strength to go, like the video said, to go the distance for Him. He went the distance for us. We need to be prepared to go the distance for Him. Acts 2.38 says, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. What does that mean? Repent means that you turn from your old friends, you turn from your old ways, your old sin, your old smoke, and your old drink, and your old carouse, and whatever the sin was, you turn from that, and you walk toward Jesus. You walk towards holiness. That's what we're talking about there. And that's what Jesus is asking you to do. He says, be holy, for I'm holy. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's what he's asking you to do. And it's as simple as this. What you have to do is reach out and take that gift. Free gift. Can't buy it, can't earn it. But Jesus is holding it out there to you tonight. And when you take it, you will feel a peace come over your being like you've never had. A cleanness like he was talking about in his testimony. And you'll know that Jesus is real. And right now if you're sitting there in sins and you're all messed up, and your life is a mess, if you'll reach out and take it in faith and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, died on the cross, you'll feel that peace come inside you. Let's all pray. No one looking around. No one looking around. Let's all pray. Now, you may have prayed this before. Most of us have. But let's all pray it again. Let's say it together. Dear Heavenly Father, I confess with my mouth, and I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, died on the cross, arose three days later, sits at the right hand of the Father. I ask Him to write my name in the book of life, keep me holy, save me in the day of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, that's the first step. But I find there's a lot of folks that said Jesus come into my heart, but they still have 
uh, yet to take enough steps to really walk the walk, and they need to get closer. So now we're going to do a rededication opportunity. If you're one of those that have said, Jesus come into my heart in the past, yet you still want to get closer to God, and you say, you know, well, I've messed up, I've fallen, I want to get back to Him, I want that cleanness again, and it's kind of like I took a shower yesterday, but I got dirty this morning, and now I need to take another shower, and I need to wash in the blood of Jesus once again. And it's not a commitment taken lightly. It's a commitment taken seriously. And so what we're going to ask you to do is make a commitment before God that from here on out, I'm going to do my best to live without sin. If you want to make that commitment, raise your hand.